Hello, I'm Dan Aykroyd. It's an honor, a privilege, and a pleasure to be able to introduce to you this film, Evidence, the case for NASA UFOs. As the goal of the UFO movement since Roswell in 1947 has been to expose the government's knowledge of the UFO phenomena and the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence, this may be the most compelling, shocking, and powerful case presented at the dawn of the age of the new millennium, to expose the hidden secrecy behind UFOs and the government's knowledge of them. This postulation now is not based on the anecdotes, film, video, and data previously assembled, but rather on the United States government's own NASA footage photographed by the astronauts themselves on numerous space shuttle missions. Broadcast live to Earth during the 1990s, it is also based on deep investigational written correspondence between the author of this film and some of NASA's research scientists. After seeing this film, you will undoubtedly conclude, as I did, that the volume and quality of the evidence is irrefutable and undeniable. Further, this evidence prepares us for perhaps the most vital revelation, which will be revealed to us in the new millennium. And that is that we are far from alone in this multiverse we inhabit, and that there is at least one species of extra-dimensional or extraterrestrial entity that is interested in our own well-being and survival in a most profound way and positive and life-affirming way. Finally, it provides empirical ancient archaeological evidence that there is someone out there, a species, a race of beings who are very interested in our progress on Earth and perhaps in a benevolent and life-affirming way. You will see that in this film, the evidence is compelling, it's genuine, it's authentic, and it gives us hope. Thank you. Here, now, evidence, the case for NASA UFOs. A deep, six-year scientific investigation into unidentified flying object phenomena broadcast live by NASA throughout the 1990s space shuttle missions. According to NASA's Space Act, signed on July 29, 1958, Section 102, Paragraph C, Subparagraph A, we read, Information obtained or developed by the administrator in the performance of his functions under this act shall be available for public inspection, except information authorized or required by federal statute to be withheld and information classified to protect the national security. Would NASA consider contact with an extraterrestrial civilization a threat to national security? And if they did, would they classify it to protect the national security? That's what this investigation is about. We're probing deep inside of NASA, looking for answers into what may be UFOs appearing during space shuttle missions and trying to find out an answer because we know that they wouldn't come out and tell us. They would classify it to protect the national security.
Welcome to Evidence, the case for NASA's UFOs. Hi, my name is David Sarita. Throughout the 1990s, a program manager of a cable TV station named Martin Stubbs recorded over 400 hours of live NASA broadcasts. During these broadcasts, there were many scenes of what appeared to be UFOs. In about 1997, a photographer friend of mine named Mike Boyle, who knew Martin Stubbs and knew about the footage, approached me and asked me to conduct an investigation into the scientific community. What you're about to see may be the most powerful case yet to prove that we have actually made contact with an extraterrestrial civilization. Recognize what is in your sight, and that which is hidden from you will become plain to you. For there is nothing hidden which will not become manifest. Jesus, the Gospel of Thomas. In 1989, I got into a long conversation about nuclear fusion with NASA's Head of Propulsion, Power, and Energy, Dr. Earl Van Landingham. At the end of the conversation, I decided to take a risk and ask him, has NASA ever made contact with an, an extraterrestrial civilization? Had they ever seen any UFOs on their space shuttle missions? He answered no, and he said, when you consider the distances between our solar system and our nearest stars, Alpha Centauri A and B, 4.3 light years from Earth. Sirius is 8.7 light years from Earth. That means that when a spacecraft is doing the speed of light, it takes 8.7 years in constant space travel, not stopping for donuts and coffee, not stopping to use the bathroom, just constant space travel to get to Earth in 8.7 years. Alpha Centauri would take 4.3 uh, years to get here. That's an incredibly long period of time and a very deep commitment to going from one point in space to the other. And to acquire velocities that great, we need a tremendous amount of energy in the form of propulsion and to create the velocity that a spacecraft needs to get from that point to the other. When Earl Van Lanningham took this into consideration, he said the energy signal, the actual energy coming off of the spacecraft would be so powerful, such an enormous amount of energy required for a spacecraft to do anywhere near light speed would be so huge, we would detect the signal well in advance of the arrival of the spacecraft. When we consider the speed of light, which is 186,282 miles per second, which comes to about 670 million miles per hour. And when we compare that to some of the propulsion systems we're using today, for example, the Apollo missions to the moon averaged just a little over 3,000 miles per hour. The space shuttle today maintains the speed of about 18,000 miles an hour as it orbits around the 25,000 mile circumference of the Earth every 90 minutes. And our fastest satellites today can do maybe 35,000 miles an hour. So when you compare TOPS 35,000 miles an hour to 670 million miles per hour, you can see that we're nowhere near the speed of light, and that's why we're very confined in our, in our space travel at the current time. So, considering that an extraterrestrial civilization would have to be far more advanced than ours, they would have to have the energy, the tremendous amount of energy coming in the form of propulsion and giving their spacecraft velocity to get here. We should detect a signal of tremendous and tremendous powerful energy. Where would we detect such a signal and how would we detect it? So far, cameras and telescopes and other means of, of making detections such as radar are limited to the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, light, in the form of photons or, or waves, bounce off of solid objects. If this was an apple or an orange, you would see photons doing the speed of light bouncing off of that so that we can observe uh, phenomena happening right in front of our eyes. So we observe everything uh, in, in regards to the speed of light. Um, if we were going to actually see a spacecraft that could come here uh, from such great distances and be able to even go way beyond the speed of light, we should be looking at something so powerful, something that we had never seen before. And I suspect where we should look is in the upper part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So for the next part, we're going to actually look at what the electromagnetic spectrum is and what light is so we can see where the best place to actually detect a signal from a spacecraft would be. 
So what is light? Light, in effect, is actually just energy vibrating in different energy spectrums. Um, I've made a chart here of the electromagnetic spectrum, what is known as the electromagnetic spectrum. And we can see, basically, from the diagram, that light is just energy in the form of waves. And these waves, as we go higher into this energy spectrum, start to oscillate faster and faster and faster per second. It was Heinrich Hertz who identified electromagnetic waves as Hertzian waves. Um, every single second you could produce one oscillating wave, you would have one hertz. And the higher you would go into this spectrum, you would get more and more and more oscillations per second in this wave. In fact, this actual chart here is not very accurate because when you get, even when you get into the uh, radio and television um, spectrum, Hertzian waves are oscillating in the, up to the millions of times per second. But um, anyway, Max Planck, the godfather of quantum physics, was the first physicist to come up with an energy formula in regards to the electromagnetic spectrum. He said energy was equal to the frequency with which these waves are quantum of light oscillated. So the, the, the more oscillations per second that occurred in a wave, the greater the energy was present. Einstein won the Nobel Prize in 1921 for explaining the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect is essentially the conversion of photons the mass particles that are basically light, and converting them into electrons, which is energy. He discovered that when photons struck a metal plate or a conductor, the metal plate ejected an electron. So when the, the photons, which are light particles, came into the object, the, the uh, conductor ejected an electron, and that electron had a charge on it. So what that showed is that photons, light, had energy in them, and that light could be converted into usable electricity. Well, and when we consider again the equation of energy in relation to space travel, and that we needed this huge amount of energy in order for a spacecraft to do the speed of light, um, many problems arise. Einstein said in his formula E equals mc squared that as a spacecraft or any mass object tried to approach the speed of light, the impeding forces of inertia became so great on that mass that the amount of energy required had to increase proportional to how fast you were going. Eventually, um, Stephen, Hawking, St Stephen Hawking's wrote of Einstein's equation that the problem with attaining the speed of light for any spacecraft would be that as that spacecraft tried to reach light speed, its mass would increase so much that an infinite amount of energy would be required for the spacecraft to attain the speed of light, and therefore it could never actually attain the speed of light. So, energy is the big problem. We need tremendous amount of energy for a, for a spacecraft to do the speed of light, and if we were going to detect a spacecraft that had the kind of energy required to go the speed of light, it should be detectable somewhere, we would hope, in the electromagnetic spectrum. Today, most of our cameras look in the visible light spectrum right here. This is all we see with our human brains. So this is what we know of light today. There are radio and TV photons. There are microwave photons. There are infrared photons detectable usually as heat. Um, some snakes and reptiles can actually see in the infrared, but our eyes can't see that low in frequency. Then there's the color red. Um, red is actually a frequency of energy. It's actually a frequency of energy wave and the color orange, and going all the way up into green, into blue, into violet. Violet is the most energetic color that our brains can see, and most of our cameras can see. Above violet is ultraviolet, and ultraviolet light is divided into near, far, and extreme. So the ultraviolet bandwidth, as we know it, actually extends a little further than my, my diagram shows here, but basically goes five or six times the bandwidth that the human eye can see. So again, if we can observe and take pictures into these higher spectrum, what we are actually seeing in that spectrum is more energy, actual energy in the form of electromagnetic waves. When we take a picture in the X-ray spectrum, we're actually seeing energy. And by the time we get up into gamma rays, we're seeing a tremendous amount of energy in the form of an observation. So again, if a UFO were coming here from another planet, from another star system, and we were expecting it to have a tremendous amount of energy to allow that spacecraft to conquer the vast distances of space in very little time, we should be detecting something that should be way up into at least the visible light spectrum and even higher. 
So far, SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence in Mountain View, California, uses a vast array of radio telescopes to try to look for intelligent signals in the form of radio signals or TV signals coming from another planet or another star. And if we receive such a signal, such as in the movie uh, Contact, um, you, you would expect to see an intelligent signal in, in the form of a radio or TV wave. But so far, that effort has retrieved nothing. I believe the reason they haven't found anything down here is because there's not enough energy down here. They forgot the energy part of the equation, that it takes energy to get velocity in, in, in the form of propulsion to get here. And even an intelligent signal coming from another planet would require tremendous amounts of energy. So I believe we should be looking at least here in the visible light spectrum, and we have. There have been many alleged reported sightings of UFOs in this spectrum because we, that's what we see. But in my philosophy, when I consider Einstein's law equals mc squared, that mass cannot attain the speed of light um, because of the forces of resistance and inertia, I would expect a spacecraft to be pure energy, something that is that is not even physical as we know it. Something that would be matter vibrating in a very high frequency state and basically we should be looking for a craft that looks like an energy ball or an energy wave and that, that energy wave should be a very, very energetic wave that should only be detectable in these upper spectrum. So what I started to do is to see where was NASA looking. NASA knows the same thing I'm telling you. Um, space scientists know this, the same thing that I'm telling you. Where are they looking? And what I found out was the space shuttle's video cameras were looking into these upper spectrum of light. In fact, the video camera on the space shuttle can see uh, near ultraviolet photons as well as the visible light spectrum. And this is exactly where we would start to see something with a tremendous amount of energy. Say this was the UFO here, um, and it wasn't visible down here, that would tell me, if we were detecting something here, just to start with, um, that that object would be a very, very high energy object. It would be a, a quantumized, uh, phenomenal uh, aircraft or spacecraft. And there would be nothing physical about it. It would be pure energy. In fact, we should be looking for a spacecraft that is made of pure energy. And um, what you're about to see in this investigation is black and white video footage taken from the space shuttle throughout the 1990s. And a camera that is capable of seeing into at least the near UV spectrum. So if some of these objects that we see in the tape were not visible to people's naked eyes down in here, um, it should come as no surprise. We're looking at high energy phenomenal objects. To punish me for my contempt for authority. Fate made me an authority myself, Albert Einstein. In 1996 97, I began my investigation at NASA. I decided who can I talk to at NASA to do an investigation into unexplainable phenomena. And at the top of my list were astrophysicists and astrochemists. I looked on NASA's website and found the email address for Dr. Joseph Newth III, the NASA head of astrochemistry, and started a dialogue with him that turned out to be very successful. He first told me that NASA was making observations of unexplainable objects entering the Earth's atmosphere, um, detectable only in the ultraviolet range of light, something that was very peculiar to me. The idea that an object could only be visible in the ultraviolet suggested to me a quantumized very, very energetic object, and that was not visible in lower spectra of light, was very, very curious. The scientist who headed the investigation was Dr. Louis A. Frank. And Frank basically made observations on satellites that were roughly 25,000 kilometers uh, away from the Earth, orbiting the Earth at a very, very large uh, a radius. And these satellite, the satellite was called Polaris. The Polaris satellite was taking pictures in the, um, in the far ultraviolet of the Earth. And he started to notice these impacting objects that he called small comets. They were about 40 feet wide, made mostly of water, and he detected they were made mostly of water. He didn't know for sure, but they were made mostly of water, and they were impacting the, the Earth at a rate of about 10 
to 20 million impacts a year. Okay, so that was where I started. Those objects apparently were fluffy, house size comets of very low density and looked like energy balls. They actually didn't really look like water and he wasn't sure they were made of water. So I decided to write Dr. Knuth a letter at NASA and ask him about these things to see if there was any similarities to these and these alleged UFOs that were showing up on the black and white video cameras of the space shuttle. I wrote him, Dear Dr. Knuth, if these little meteors are hitting the Earth's upper atmosphere and dissolving, wouldn't the intense solar radiation break the H2O into oxygen and hydrogen separated, thus releasing tremendous amounts of oxygen into the upper atmosphere? When oxygen undergoes further solar radiation, O2, oxygen, transmutates into O3, ozone. Could these space meteors be actually healing our ozone layer? Is this proof that there is a God? Please answer. I wasn't actually kidding about the ozone question because water basically is made of hydrogen and oxygen. And when water is exposed to the intense radiation from our sun, x-rays and gamma rays with temperatures that are off the chart as far as humans could possibly bear. And even ultraviolet light we know is much hotter than, than visible light. Uh, we know that because we get skin cancer when we allow ultraviolet light to penetrate the Earth's atmosphere and it can actually cause very serious damage to our skin. The first question about these objects being water to me was how could water transit from one point in space to Earth and actually survive this intense radiation. In theory, in space theory, space is minus 273 degrees centigrade. It's freezing in space. But as soon as any object, like any gas, liquid, or object appears in space, it basically gets bombarded by tremendous radiation from the sun and tremendous radiation from the stars in the form of X-rays and gamma rays and ultraviolet light and so on. And the temperatures the nuclear reactions that go on in the water would be so intense the water would burn up in a matter of seconds. These are allegedly 40 ton balls of water doing 35,000 miles an hour, but how did they get here? How did they come from the vast distances of space and get here and remain as they are? It has been known for a very long time that the Earth is under constant bombardment by extraterrestrial material, 20 kilotons per year, most of which is micron-sized dust shed by comets and asteroids, as well as some finite number of larger meteors. The house-sized comet proposal is in addition to this known flux and is unique in that these bodies are supposed to consist mostly or almost exclusively of water. Because no satisfactory mechanism has been proposed to explain their survival in the interplanetary medium or their non-detection by a variety of other means, example, IRAS, COBE, and I IEU, most scientists do not believe that such bodies actually exist. The general belief is that the observations are valid, but the interpretations are wrong. If the interpretation is correct, however, the rate of deposition into the Earth's atmosphere of oxygen or water is only a minute fraction of the amount that is already there, except in the uppermost layers. For this reason, additional oxygen would be much too small to measure. If large masses of meteoric material relative to the mass of the Earth's atmosphere to impact the Earth, the effects would be disastrous even if the impactors were only made of water. So he's saying that these small amounts of water that are entering the Earth's atmosphere don't have the potential, in his opinion, as the head of astrochemistry at NASA, to produce a significant amount of ozone to hear our ozone layer. But he does understand the fundamental problem. Most scientists don't believe these detections, the detection of these objects are real because none of them show up on infrared satellites. Infrared is heat. And again, if intense radiation were hitting these balls of water and they started to heat up, you should get a very, very high heat signal that should be detectable on infrared, but no signal appeared. So the mystery gets very, very deep about what these objects may be. Dear Dr. Newth, thanks for the info. So the phenomena couldn't be from the comet. However, how could any object made mostly of water in liquid form survive in space over any great distances unless it had some kind of phenomenal membrane to protect it? Wouldn't the H2O, as you observe, absorb the intense radiation from the sun and produce heat so much that it would dissolve the H and the O? If the temperature of cold space is minus 273 degrees centigrade, and upon exposure to direct intense radiation from the sun, tremendous heat is formed. At 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, hydrogen separates from oxygen. How could such an object travel in space for even a minute, let alone travel from one point in space to another, unless? Again, 
um, I'm proposing the problem of how these objects detected by Dr. Louis A. Frank in the ultraviolet, how could they have possibly arrived at Earth? In theory, they could not. It didn't make any sense to me how they could. He immediately wrote me back, Dear Mr. Sarita, you have enumerated a few of the problems with Frank's hypothesis and probably now realize why few scientists think that the phenomena seen by Lou Frank are actually comets. No one doubts that he has observed something in capital letters, just not comets. In spite of the fact that many people are sure that Frank's explanation for his observations are incorrect, there has been no good alternative explanation proposed yet. I'm sure that there will eventually be one that even Frank can agree to. So this letter shows amazing evidence that NASA is actually detecting something in space that's moving, that's coming to our Earth, and it shouldn't be there. Something that defies all the laws of physics. If you remember what I said about the electromagnetic spectrum earlier, that we should be detecting an object in the high upper frequencies of light and not detectable in the lower, that that would be evident to suggest that we're looking at a highly quantized object, which means a highly energized object. This detection fits all of those descriptions and all those criteria. But that isn't the, this isn't the end of my investigation. But for now, this is what, we, what I found out, that NASA was observing something out there and they didn't know what it was. It was the first time that anyone at NASA could admit that there was an unidentified and unexplained phenomena happening in our skies and that no one had the answer. Dear Dr. Newth, thanks for the email response to my question. I'm amazed at how such a phenomena can be observed, yet the denial of its existence because it doesn't fit into the theory of the solar system. What are the chances that the H2O house-sized objects are tailings from the recent passing of the comet hale bob Any ideas? Do you have any more thoughts on this? Please send email. Thanks. Dear Mr. Sarita, I would agree with your amazement in the scientific community ignoring Frank's observations if it were true. However, that is not the case. I know of no individual that does not believe that Frank saw something. The controversy centers just on what it was that yielded the signal. He believes that house-sized comets of very low density are responsible for both the recent detection of water and his previous 1985's ob observations using the DE spacecraft's UV cameras. Few other people agree with him. By the way, those previous observations would mean that the phenomena would be a continuous process rather than one associated with a particular comet such as hale bob The reasons are many, but the best center on the fact that these objects should have been detected on several other satellites such as COBE, IRAS, and ISO. Those are infrared satellites. These satellites have instruments that are very sensitive to radiation in the infrared region. These fluffy, house-sized objects should be at a temperature near 300 K or even higher as they near the Earth since very fluffy objects are much better absorbers in the visible than they are emitters in the infrared. <laughs> they should therefore be infrared beacons because they are so very close. Yet no other satellite has ever seen evidence of these objects. This includes a vast array of Department of Defense satellites as far as I can learn. Because these objects are being bombarded by high energy cosmic rays, we should get a tremendous amount of heat. Dr. Newth suggests 300K, which makes, should make them infrared beacons. But NASA's infrared satellites, COBE, IRAS, and ISO, can't see these objects. Again, this tells me something. It tells me I'm looking at a very high energy quantized object that's only visible in the near and far ultraviolet light spectrum, but not visible in the lower spectrum. So I detect possibly we're looking at some sort of an extraterrestrial intelligence or possibly a UFO, but I haven't drawn that conclusion yet. In the game of process of elimination, we've eliminated space debris, we've eliminated shooting stars, and we've eliminated space junk because none of those things would be invisible in the lower spectrum of light. They would all be detectable at least in infrared and invisible and also in, in, in lower spectrum. But they're not. These things are only detectable in the UV spectrum. Newth continues, it simply means that we are still looking for a suitable explanation. Frank's hypothesis has not yielded any predictions that could be verified by observation that have been shown to be correct and has many observable consequences that are demonstrably false. Until he has a satisfactory answer for why we do not see what we should see in the infrared, most people will continue to believe that his interpretation of his own UV observations are flawed. They will, however, believe that he does observe something. 
So again, NASA is admitting that they are actually detecting something, something that shouldn't be there. Other scientists deny the detection of these objects because they've never seen a high energy object before. They've never detected something that doesn't show up in infrared. And I detect the signatures written all over this that we're looking at a very high quantumized object, the very type of object that I think we should be looking for in regards to extraterrestrial intelligence. Water could essentially travel from one part of the solar system to the other and, and actually protect itself from the intense cosmic rays of the sun. But the only way water could do that is if these alleged water balls that are about 40 feet in diameter and 40 tons each had a phenomenal membrane or radiant barrier to protect it. Um, example, space shuttles wrap them, the space shuttle is wrapped in an aluminum foil that actually bounces out uh, radiant rays of X-rays and gamma rays and actually protects the space shuttle from being destroyed and overly radiated by these highly charged um, forms of radiation. Um, a water ball is so vulnerable out above the Earth's atmosphere that without some kind of phenomenal membrane protecting it, it couldn't survive. But the only way I suggest that it could actually arrive from one point in space to the other assuming that Dr. Louis A. Frank is correct in his, in his interpretation that there's actually water in these balls is as if they had this phenomenal membrane around them. If you can imagine kind of a mirror-like or foil-like barrier, that barrier would shine and reflect off all of the, of, the, of the very, very harmful rays and actually protect the water. But that would make it an intelligent thing. That would also make it a living thing. Cezanne Giorgi, the Nobel Prize winning biochemist and discoverer of vitamin C, has called water the matrix of life, without it, life cannot take hold, nor could the evolution of life begin. Basically, all living things, including humans, are made mostly of water, but we have actual barriers. In the case of humans, we have skin, and, and that skin has pigment in it that protects us from harmful ultraviolet rays of light that are filtered out. Um, plants are made mostly of water. Animals um, have thick skin, but they're made mostly of water. So, I'm not suggesting that some naked um, uh, alien uh, entity is actually flying through space and entering our Earth's atmosphere, but I'm suggesting that if water is surviving deep transits in space in such a small quantity, that it, the only way it could do it is if it had some kind of phenomenal membrane pr to protect it. But I can't prove that in this case yet because no one has actually captured one of Lou Frank's mysterious uh, small comets or water balls or whatever we want to call them. At this point, most scientists agree that he observed something, but we just don't know what that is yet. There was one more peculiar thing about Dr. Noose's last letter to me. It reads, Yet no other satellite has ever seen evidence of these objects. This includes a vast array of Department of Defense satellites, as well and as far as I can learn. If the Department of Defense was looking for these objects, we must assume that they were also mystified, that someone at NASA was mystified about these objects. Because if they were water balls, why would the Department of Defense go looking for them? And if, as some scientists hypothesize, that there was nothing there, and that Lou Frank made an incorrect interpretation of a signal, then why, again, would the Department of Defense use a vast array of satellites to look for these objects? We must assume that someone up at NASA, very, very high up, ordered the, the, the search and the, uh, the effort to actually try to detect these objects on a vast array of more sophisticated satellites. And that would mean that they don't really believe that these things are just some sort of passing and, and unimportant phenomena. Other environmentally interesting targets uh, of opportunity during the uh, day passes. Typically, when the orbiter is uh, on the dark side of the Earth, as it, as it is now, at least for the next uh, five to six minutes, the low-light level uh, black and white cameras uh, are much better at uh, observing the Earth's surface and the star clusters as the orbiter passes uh, high overhead. When the orbiter moves within uh, a daylight pass, the color cameras in the payload bay are used to uh, get uh, more interesting sights uh, on the day side of the earth.
The first object that we're looking at on this videotape, we have one of three incredible phenomena happening at the same time, so we're going to kind of break it down and start with each phenomena and kind of go into them a little bit. So the first thing we see is a bright fireball leaving the zero plane of Earth, Earth is over here, um, at about 35 degrees away from the zero point and going straight up out into space up here. The object is moving across the screen. And we have to assume what is this object. For one, we're looking at the Space Shuttle's black and white low-level cameras that can see into the near ultraviolet spectrum, so we may be seeing it a quantumized object. But also, it's leaving Earth's gravity, and that's something that is impossible unless the object has internal energy in it, energy that's powerful enough for the object to actually escape gravity. So this object is definitely escaping the Earth's gravity, and, and that is simply cannot be a natural object. Any meteor, shooting star, or piece of space dust is going to get pulled into the powerful gravity of the Earth and burn up as it hits the Earth's atmosphere and, and disappear in a matter of a few kilometers, assuming it's a very small object. This object doesn't do that. It escapes Earth's gravity, so we have to assume that it has internal energy in it, and that leads us to the possibility that we're looking at a UFO. The second object we're looking at in this scene is called the high-speed turn. If you're looking up in this portion of the video monitor, you're going to see an object come in, make a high-speed turn, heading out into space, a very, not quite a 90-degree turn, and then it will be followed and pursued by another, another actual object going this way. So again, when we consider the physics of a solid object traveling at, at least a couple of thousand miles an hour, making a high-speed turn, and probably in the neighborhood of 20 to 30,000 miles an hour, the physics of a turn like that is actually impossible. For any physical object going that speed to make a sudden turn, the g-forces on the turn alone would destroy physically, actually, your entire physical body if you were inside of a spacecraft as we know it, would just smash like a pancake. You'd be, you'd be uh, spam in a can. You'd be dead. In fact, even a meteorite a solid object making a turn like that, the explosion on the turn, the g-forces in the collapsing of matter would cause a nuclear uh, fusion explosion. It would cause a massive explosion. And if this high-speed turn was caused by uh, an impact, a collision with another object, and then deflected off of the object and made a turn, you should see a massive explosion at the point of the turn, and we don't actually see that. The only way that I hypothesize that any object could make a high-speed turn like this is if the object was a highly quantized energy phenomena, that if matter, mass, was actually transformed into high-frequency waveform energy and had no, no actual weight to it, in fact, it, was, it became lighter than the lightest elements we know on the Earth, only then could an object make a turn like that and survive, and physically and structurally survive. And again, the very fact that this can do this suggests to me the kind of physics that these craft are using. They have taken raw, solid mass, a solid spacecraft or solid material, changed the frequency into a high energy waveform, and in that waveform, they're able to not only conquer light speed and, and possibly do light speed and conquer light speed, but they're able to make turns like this and maneuver uh, in ways that, that are just impossible, that would cause a nervous breakdown to any modern physicist. No physicist can look at this object and, and admit that we're looking at anything other than possibly dust in front of the camera lens or some sort of debris because they know that for any massive object to be doing velocities greater than even, even at 100 miles an hour, which this object is obviously going much faster than, imagine going 100 miles an hour on a freeway and all of a sudden you just turn on a dime and go in a different direction what would happen to your body inside of the automobile. You would go flying through the windshield at 100 miles an hour and, and you'd be dead. So what kind of physics are these craft using? What, what are we actually seeing here? Is this space dust? Is this debris? Is this a shooting star? Is this a meteorite? The answer is no, because we know that no physical object could structurally survive a turn like that. What you're about to see is the hypervelocity object sequence. It's actually one of my favorites in the investigation because it has some very powerful conclusions. So if you look in your video monitor, over here to the lower right, you're going to look for a little fuzzy object. It's very fuzzy. There's a lot of static on the screen. 
And you're going to see it moving at incredible speeds in a very curved fashion, very curved fashion, going into the atmosphere and disappearing at the point of the horizon right here. It's absolutely conclusive if this object disappears on the horizon that this is not a piece of dust in the, in the near fields of the camera lens 20 or 30 miles away or even 10 feet away. The object moves in a very curved fashion suggest it's, suggesting it's moving over the curvature of the earth and very curved and disappearing on the horizon and probably going around to the other side of the planet. The fact that it's going around the planet and disappearing on the horizon is absolutely conclusive. And this is a very important piece of footage because nowhere else do we have a scene where we have such powerful relativity. Because we know the object is going from here to here, if we could assume the distance, if we could actually find the distance that the object moved, we could calculate its speed. Assuming the Earth is approximately 25,000 miles in circumference and that using some modest calculations as to the curvature of the Earth here, I estimate that the distance between here to here is roughly 1 24th, 1 25th of the Earth's circumference. So that would make the distance between here and here roughly 1,000 miles. If the object traveled between here and here, I count in approximately four seconds. We can assume that the object is going approximately 250 miles per second. That is an incredible speed. It actually comes to 900,000 miles per hour. 900,000 miles per hour is faster than any known object to, to, to man and to, and to space flight. Assuming the space shuttle is traveling at approximately 18,000 miles in the opposite direction, 18,000 miles an hour, I would have to subtract that speed and we would come to 882,000 miles per hour for the object. So it's roughly going between 900,000 and 882,000 miles per hour. Incredible speed. We've never seen anything going this fast. Remember, the Apollo missions to the moon averaged 3,300 miles per hour. The space shuttle is going at 18,000 miles per hour. And meteorites and uh, shooting stars top at around 45,000 miles an hour. So we know from the object speed that we're looking at that there's no way this is a shooting star or, or a meteorite. It's far, too, it's far too fast to be an object like that. And also, our fastest satellites using ion propulsion drive systems are going roughly tops at maybe 35,000 miles an hour. So comparatively, if all of this is correct and the object is actually traveling at 900,000 miles an hour, we're looking at speeds that are beyond anything known to science at this point in time. So before we actually decide if this is actually a UFO, we will have to do some, some estimates and some studies into advanced propulsion systems being conducted at some of our universities and some of our space labs to see if anyone could come up with speeds anywhere near this. We know that current technology, again, NASA's it, today is actually using thruster engines in the space shuttle and the Apollo missions to the moon were also using thruster engines that fire out tremendous amounts of hydrogen and other gases at tremendous speeds and with all of that thrust capacity we're getting speeds between you know, may, maybe topsing, topping at around 20,000 miles an hour. But actually we're getting beyond that now. We're starting to go into what are called ion propulsion systems. Remember in 1989, after I had a long conversation with Dr. Earl Van Landingham, then head of propulsion power and energy division at NASA, we were talking about nuclear fusion, a particular type of nuclear fusion called deuterium-helium-3 fusion. Deuterium-helium-3 fusion was being developed by a scientist named Dr. Bogdan Kastel-Maglich, an MIT PhD, who had spent about $27 million in research onto a new type of non-radioactive fusion. NASA at the time was very interested in this, Dr. Van Der Lang told me, because NASA was looking for a space power source. 
They needed a type of energy to drive its future ion propulsion systems. At the present day, the best power sources they could get were around only 100 kilowatts, 100,000 watts. So looking at deuterium helium-3 fusion, um, Dr. Van Nuttingham told me, produces an energy of 18 million electron volts per fusion, an energy level that is far beyond any of our current um, space power sources. He also said that he was very interested in this particular type of fusion because he realized that 18 MeV protons, um, 18 MeV energies applied to protons could power spacecraft at velocities beyond our, our current imaginations. He said at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, they were doing studies into what are called anti-proton anti propulsion systems. He said that 18 MeV protons could send spacecraft up to one-tenth the speed of light. One-tenth the speed of light comes to 67 million miles per hour. 67 million miles per hour. So if we could imagine that somebody has actually developed a technology that powerful, we can see when we do a comparative analysis that our object that is moving between 900,000 and 882,000 miles per hour fits well within the constraints of a nuclear propulsion system. But we know for certain that Dr. Bogdan Castle Maglish's helium-3 fusion did not get proper funding. The project didn't get completed. At the time, James Fletcher, who was then the chief administrator of NASA, went to the United States Congress and asked for funding to complete this fusion because, again, it would be the most powerful form of energy for, for space stations and for space propulsion systems that NASA had ever developed. He was turned down. The project didn't get completion funding and to this day remains you know, in a scientist's mind and it hasn't gone any further than that. So where else on the Earth could we find evidence of nuclear propulsion systems being developed? We've all heard of the Area 51, the mysterious basin in Nevada where people see phenomenal black ops and secret projects and objects that may be UFOs flying in the skies being test flown by secret Air Force Base uh, scientists. Well, I did some research into the top four defense contractors in the United States. You have Boeing, you have SAIC, you have Lockheed Martin, and you have EG&G. EG&G boasts that in 1968, at the NTS rocket station in Nevada, that's the nuclear test site rocket station in Nevada, Phobos 2A, the most powerful nuclear reactor and nuclear propulsion system is successfully tested. The most powerful nuclear propulsion system ever tested, successful in 1968. So if that was successful in 1968, we can only imagine where that research is today. But NASA doesn't use nuclear propulsion systems, so who is using these technologies and where? So if, it could be possible, it could be possible that there is a secret alternative space program utilizing these technologies and that the object we just saw is actually a test flight that the space shuttle crew knew was going on and actually videotaped it as a test to see the capabilities of this craft. That's a possibility, but we can't actually arrive there yet because we have one more problem. I'll demonstrate what that is. The space shuttle flies at an altitude of about 300 miles above the Earth. This is the space shuttle here, and this is the top of the atmosphere here. The top of the atmosphere is at about 100 miles, according to Dr. Newth at NASA. So we can assume there's a distance between the top of the Earth's atmosphere and the space shuttle of 200 miles. Okay, so that means if the object, as we have concluded, was moving over the curvature of the Earth and disappeared in the atmosphere and went around the other side, and we didn't see the object go way up here and loop out and go around the other side, that would mean it went above the top of the atmosphere. It disappeared right in here, which means it must have went around the other side of the Earth. So we know the object is down in the 100-mile range. If the object is down in the 100-mile range, and the space shuttle is at 300 miles above it, then the distance between the object and the, and the space shuttle must be at least 200 miles. The very fact that you can even see an object from 200 miles is incredible. 
Have you ever looked up at a 747 flying in the sky above you at 35,000 feet? You can see the vapor trail very clearly, but the 747 is just a tiny dot in the sky. 35,000 feet is roughly between 6 and 7 miles away. In this case, we're looking at an object 200 miles away. Again, I state it's amazing that you can even see an object that far away. So if we're looking at an object 200 away and it's even visible from 200 miles away, my estimates suggest that the object must be massive in size, far bigger than a 747. I guess approximately around a half a kilometer to a half a mile wide. If the object is a, is a half a kilometer to a half a mile wide, it must be something beyond anything we're developing here on the Earth because there's no way we can imagine that our space programs are developing spaceships that's that large, spaceships that large, that are capable of going 900,000, 800,000 miles. And another problem exists in, in, the, in this the idea that this may be a, a human-made or a man-made spacecraft. If the object is going at nearly a million miles an hour and moving in this curved fashion over the Earth, as soon as you start accelerating a spacecraft or, or, or an aircraft and it starts making turns, you get g-forces. At these speeds, I don't believe any pilot could possibly survive the turns and the g-forces at at 900,000 miles an hour. I think it would be impossible on the human body. Again, suggesting that this is a highly energized quantum object that's vibrating at a very high frequency, which means its mass has been converted into a very high frequency wave state, which can allow it to make these incredibly high speed turns and even radical turns like the object we saw earlier, and, and basically implicating the possibility of what we're looking at is actually a UFO. The next scene you're about to look at is called the Hubble Repair Mission Sequence. It shows two astronauts repairing the Space Hubble Telescope. What's peculiar about it is there's an object going behind them. It has a kind of a light flashing to it. And it goes behind the astronauts and we actually hear them talking about it. So listen closely to what they actually say. Looks like you got an object right in front of you, Mark. Can you look out there? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Never mind. So what were the astronauts actually saying? We heard, it looks like you got an object right out there in front of you, Mark. Are you looking out there? It's about your 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, going away. Don't worry about it. We know the astronaut on the left is probably the one we're talking about. That's probably Mark because at his 11 o'clock position is where we actually see the UFO or we see the unidentified object. It has a light flashing to it. It's definitely going behind them. So we, we can assume immediately that obviously these astronauts are not talking about space debris or space junk going by because it's obviously something of significance. It captures their attention for a moment and they're told to ignore it and to focus on the repair of the mission. So we could assume maybe they've been seeing these things frequently out there. Maybe this is an ordinary occurrence um, and it's not something they should become so alarmed about. Later we hear, uh, we think the camera filter came off Mark. We know camera filters are screwed tightly onto cameras and there's no way they would unscrew in space and go floating out there. So obviously, again, this is one of NASA's blatant lies trying to tell the public during a live broadcast that what we're seeing is something that they can explain. The next scene you're about to see is called the Russian Space Station Mir Sequence. The first part of this scene actually just shows two little, what appear to be shooting stars and what we're told are shooting stars streaking through the hue of the Earth's atmosphere. The problem is they just keep going, and they keep going, and they keep going. They never burn up. So what's wrong with this scene? They appear to be just meteors, and I shouldn't really be, be even be arguing the point, but I am, for one very specific reason. Meteorites, when they strike the Earth's atmosphere, they're usually very small pieces of, of rock, maybe this big around, some this big around, and some, some larger ones. But most meteorites are small enough that they burn up within a few kilometers. After they come in into the Earth's atmosphere, they start to flare and burn up. 
and the, the, the resistance on the Earth's atmosphere and their velocity produces so much heat that they're basically gone in a matter of a split second. If you've ever seen a shooting star streaking across the sky, it literally just streaks, you see it, and then it's gone. That's because it burnt up and it's finished. So the only way a meteorite could go for the large distances that these objects go through and continue to streak on would be as if they were massive in size. In 1908 in Siberia, an event called the Tunguska event, um, a massive 70 meter wide meteorite, only 70 meters wide, struck the forest in northern Russia and led to an explosion that was equal to several nuclear blasts, several uh, Hiroshima's, leveled uh, miles and miles and miles of force with a massive impact. So we know, again, the only way an object could travel and survive the vast distances would be as if it's a massive meteorite, a massive object. And we know from history that during the 1990s we never had a massive meteoric impact on the Earth. So what were these objects doing streaking over such vast distances if they were indeed meteorites? It's, it's curious. I'm, I'm not going to arrive at UFO with these little objects, but it's a very, very curious scene. So the next part of the Russian space station mirror sequence I find really funny. This, this scene to me is, is humorous because what is actually happening, we have the day glow of the Earth here, the Earth's atmosphere here, the Earth is down here, and we see all these white dots, which we assume are stars, and the commentary is that the astronauts are actually looking for the Russian space station mirror. Mirror is a very big space station, and it's something you sh should be able to detect out there with your eyes and with cameras with zoom lenses on them. But the problem is, while they're looking for the mirror, there's a lot of other objects that are moving very slowly. You'll see big blobs of light that are moving really slowly in many different points across the screen. Now, if we're looking at stars, all of the stars with the movement of the space shuttle are going to be moving in a consistent line together in unison because they're not moving points of light. But distinguishable from the stars are other blobs of light moving around. And we also see a bunch of things that we're told are shooting stars coming in at right angles to the camera, coming into the Earth's atmosphere. And we see these things going in all sorts of different directions. Uh, we actually even see one that leaving the Earth's atmosphere going out in this direction, which is something, again, impossible for a meteorite or a shooting star or even space debris to do because it, anything leaving Earth's atmosphere requires internal energy, and internal energy requires and, assume, and, and suggests intelligence. So again, what's very disturbing, what's funny about it is, is they can't actually find the mirror because there's so many other things actually moving around out there. This is Mission Control Houston. We are using the payload bay cameras right now to hopefully catch a glimpse of the Russian space station mirror as it performs an on-orbit burn though it will be difficult to uh, pick Mir out from the stars as they pass behind us. The uh, payload bay cameras are positioned such that they're looking straight back, back, straight back behind the orbiter where the Mir is flying at about 850 nautical miles behind us. No joy from here, sorry. Hope it was a good one though for our friends. Thank you, sir. We could not see it here either. We'll wait two or three more minutes till sunrise, and then uh, at that time, give you a go for KU Stowe. We're at a mission lapse time of seven days, 13 hours, and 17 minutes. This is Mission Control, Houston. The uh, Mir space station is now visible on the uh, far left-hand side of the screen, about about an inch from the bottom of this particular picture. Okay, the Mir space station is the small flashing light in the center, about an inch from. Camera Charlie on a monitor. The uh, left hand side of the screen. It's slowly. Tally Ho on the camera. Um, it is slowly moving closer to the left hand side and is a very, has a very light flashing to it. We think on the middle of the screen, way to the left hand side. 
We think you can see a flashing light just a little bit to the left of the center of the screen, very faint. Yeah, we do see something flashing visually, but we're not sure that that might be... Uh This is Mission Control Houston. Once again, we believe we were just able to spot the Mir spacecraft as it flies about at 850 nautical miles behind Discovery. So you just saw the footage. You saw a lot of things streaking out there. You saw the confusion of the astronauts trying to find the space station in Mir. And in the end, they never really find it. Again, if what we're looking at is number, the number one contention of NASA is everything on these videotapes is just debris floating by and we're seeing optical illusions. Do you really think an astronaut can't tell the difference between the space station mirror and a piece of debris, a piece of dust, or, or a cookie crumb floating through space? Of course they can tell the difference. So whatever the other objects are that are moving around out there obviously aren't debris. There are other objects that are obscuring their view and are confusing the astronauts. But even more peculiar to me, the theory that the streaking objects are actually meteorites. If the streaking objects were really meteors, then why do they never appear in this video to burn up and disintegrate into the atmosphere? If they were meteors, they should behave like them. And even more curious, as the shuttle is flying 200 miles above the top of the atmosphere, why are we seeing meteors at all? In theory, they should be invisible dark bodies until they strike the upper atmosphere and start to produce a meteoric burn, making them luminous and clearly visible. But many of these streaking objects are highly luminous way above the top of the atmosphere. Could they be unidentified flying objects? In 1993, I met with and had a casual conversation with the head of the Russian space program. He didn't speak English. But through an interpreter, a young Russian woman, I asked him if the Russian cosmonauts had ever seen UFOs. He laughed but answered my question. We have never seen anything like that. If the cosmonauts had seen UFOs, I would be the first one to know about it. But there has been some evidence from the Russian cosmonauts saying they had actually seen flying saucers on recent missions to the Mir. A Russian cosmonaut named Alexander Baladin stated at a UFO convention that Flying saucers have come into close proximity to the Mir space station many times. He added there is sufficient evidence to warrant a scientific study of the phenomena and that it is time that world governments officially acknowledge the UFO phenomenon's existence. Baldwin disclosed December 23, 1998 during an international ufology forum in Brazil that he and fellow cosmonaut Musa Manarov had seen UFOs. During docking operations between his space capsule and the Mir, Baladin saw a glowing object a short distance away. Could these be the same lights that are being witnessed on this NASA Russian space station Mir sequence? Musa Manarov captured the UFOs on videotape that was shown during the UFO Congress in Brazil. Baladin claimed that the recording and other evidence presented during the Congress must be studied by an international scientific commission. Why were Russian cosmonauts coming forward to tell their stories while American astronauts wouldn't breathe a word? Were the Russian cosmonauts more excited about sharing information on intelligent contact with extraterrestrials and with the world than Americans? So I waited for the answer from Joseph Newth, and considering the fact that Congress was already doing hearings into space shuttle footage, I expected a very, very negative answer, and that's what I got. The letter reads, Dear Mr. Sarita, I did look carefully at the video you sent, and I really must apologize to you for not replying sooner. The objects that were on the video 
appear to me to be floating debris from the cargo bay of the space shuttle. These objects often appear to be fuzzy because they got quite close to the camera and were often out of focus. Because they were so close, they also appeared to travel at high speed, and any minor disturbance within the shuttle environment, for example outgassing, firing of attitude control thrusters, etc., is magnified enormously, thus the rapid turns. The spotty illumination and shadowing in the bay can also make objects suddenly appear or disappear. I saw a wealth of similar debris come up off the floor and out of many minor crevices during microgravity flights on the KC-135. The space shuttle is a notoriously dirty environment by any laboratory standards. That's why they always close up any shuttle service and buy the shuttle well before it gets too near. This is especially true for satellites such as the Hubble Space Telescope with high precision optics. Again, I do apologize for not responding sooner. Sign Joe Newt. The point of philosophy is to start with something so simple as not to seem worth stating, and to end with something so paradoxical that no one will believe it. Bertrand Russell. The alternative space program theory hypothesizes that while NASA is launching the space shuttle and the Apollo missions to the moon, there is a secret, hidden space program that is going on behind closed doors. Deep inside of secret uh, Air Force bases and research labs, black op projects are developing very, very high technology and high space technology vehicles that no one knows about, that only a few people know who are sequestered in these secret labs. Everyone has heard of Area 51 in Nevada at this point in time, and at Area 51, many people have gone out with video cameras and videotaped incredible objects glowing very brightly, shooting through the sky at amazing speeds, and even making angular turns, similar to some of the stuff we've seen on the NASA transmissions. So we asked the question, are some of these mysterious objects that are appearing on the NASA videos the alternative space program vehicles being witnessed by the cameras of the space shuttle themselves? NASA peering into the alternative space program knowing very, very well of its, of its existence and actually studying the, the maneuverability and some of the capabilities of these aircraft. There are four major defense contractors in the United States. You have Boeing, you have Lockheed Martin, you have SAIC, and you have EG&G. EG&G, one of the largest of the four, in 1968 at the nuclear test site rocket station successfully tested Phobos 2A, the most powerful nuclear propulsion uh, drive ever developed, was successful in 1968. Today, in the year 2001, we have to assume that nuclear propulsion systems are very, very advanced. But there's another problem. So far to date, most nuclear uh, reaction systems that have been developed are very, very radioactive. Earlier I was talking about deuterium helium-3 fusion developed by Bogdan Castle Maglitch from MIT and how that project produced a non-radioactive 18 million electron volt charge and how that could be applied to not only powering space stations but also um, driving the ion generators and ion propulsion systems for very, very fast space uh, travel. But that system didn't get developed. So looking at how radioactive nuclear power sources are, we would expect, if one of these vehicles were flying around our skies, that the astronauts would have to wear tremendous shielding in the form of a spacesuit to protect them from severe levels of radiation. But yet, if anyone had ever actually encountered one of these craft on their own, they would be exposed to high levels of radiation. So we, we, we would need evidence, evidence of that fact. There are many evidence in many cases like that. Betty and Barney Hill, both people who were um, witnesses to a UFO um, event. They actually saw UFOs, they claim, and they actually have documented severe radiation burns on their body. Betty Cash, in 1980 in Texas, saw a UFO and pursued it, came into close proximity of, of this UFO. She received severe, severe radiation burns for which she was hospitalized. Um, back in, in uh, 1998, she died. No one knows for certain whether she died of, of the severe radiation burns that she received, but we do know that she received severe radiation burns. Now, if we're going to make a distinction between an extraterrestrial civilization spacecraft 
and an actual alternative space program space vehicle, this is where we would make our distinction. We can't assume that someone traveling from Alpha Centauri or Ceres coming here and traveling for 8.7 years would expose their bodies to high levels of radiation. They, they would die long before they even got here. So what the signature of, of one of these radioactive vehicles would be would be exactly like what happened to, to Betty Cash. And I think there are many other documented cases out there where people have encountered UFOs and received radiation burns. So it might be a signature. It might be an answer pointing to the possibility that, that we have developed very, very advanced spacecraft and we do have what may be UFOs in our own uh, space programs, but somehow it hasn't really leaked out to the public. The power of accurate observation is commonly called cynicism by those who have not got it. George Bernard Shaw. So at this point in my investigation, I was beginning to not trust NASA. I was not really happy with the answers to the questions I sent them. And I detected they knew a lot more that they weren't telling me. So I decided to use the Freedom of Information Act request against Dr. Joseph Newton III and request that all files on this subject be delivered to me so that I could look deeper into it. The letter he wrote me back on February 24, 1999. Dear Mr. Sarita, enclosed with this letter is my entire file on the matter in question, including the videotape that you so kindly sent to me for my comment. I did not send copies of my email replies to your previous email messages, as I infer from the content of this present letter that you retain your own copies of this correspondence. Since I'm not at all interested in the speculations of Dr. Lou Frank, and since my own research interests do not involve the data sets upon which these speculations are based, I have no other information on these matters other than that enclosed, all of which was sent by you. Signed, Dr. Joseph A. Newt III, Head, Astrochemistry Branch. P.S. Thanks for the great stamps. I had not seen anything like them previously. So at this point, Dr. Newth is saying that there is no other file at NASA, that my investigation that I'm conducting is the only file and the only investigation being done into this phenomena at NASA. I didn't know whether to believe it, but I didn't want to pursue him any further on that particular question, and I wanted to move on with our dialogue and see how much deeper I could go into this investigation. Later, I would have to try to contact Dr. Louis A. Frank myself and try to get a dialogue going with him. On February 25, 1996, on Space Shuttle Mission Number STS-75, NASA launched a possible breakthrough energy technology experiment. They launched a 12-mile long electrical conductor cable called an electrodynamic tether designed to collect high-energy electrons in the Earth's ionosphere and magnetic fields. The motion of the conductor tether across the Earth's magnetic fields induces a voltage along the 12-mile length of the tether. Utilizing estimates and the charge densities of the Earth's magnetic fields and the ionosphere, the voltage produced is expected to be up to several hundred volts per kilometer. If successful, the experiment could produce a lot of electrical power. If additional power is driven along the tether in the opposite direction to that which it normally wants to flow, the tether, in theory, could push creating propulsion against the Earth's gravity to raise the shuttle's orbit. The advantage to this revolutionary technology in propulsion is that it does not require any rocket fuel. If successful, electrodynamic tethers could prove a way to greatly reduce the cost of in-space propulsion. For example, the International Space Station could keep itself in orbit, saving nearly $2 billion in orbital reboost rocket fuel for every 10 years of the station's operations. But on February 25th, after the 12-mile tether began producing electricity, an unexpected overload of electrical energy fluctuating between 2 and 10 times that predicted due to inaccurate estimates in the electrical charge of the Earth's magnetic fields, ionosphere, and possibly space radiation, fried the tether conductor cable and it broke, severing it from the space shuttle. So the tether has broken at the, uh, at the boom. The tether has broken and is going away from us. Get it on the, get it on the TV, Claude. Please get it on the TV. The tether has broken. Copy.
Columbia and the satellite now 77 nautical miles apart. Again, that call reporting that uh, the crew can see the tether and uh, see the satellite, to, that it's beautiful. This view uh, showing uh, the satellite. Again, uh, just moving into sunrise. 81 nautical miles now from Columbia. Franklin, uh, we see a long line, a couple of star-like things, and a lot of things swimming in the foreground. Can you describe what you're seeing? Well, the long line is, uh, is a tether, um, and uh, there's a little bit of debris that uh, kind of flies with us, and uh, it's uh, illuminated by the sun at such low angles. So this is this lot of stray light and it's getting washed out uh, quickly, but uh, Claude is trying to do a, a quick, uh, good job here adjusting the cameras. Copy that. You know that description by the crew, this is uh, the tether in the satellite, uh, the satellite with 12, approximately 12 miles of tether still attached to it. Columbia and the satellite are now just passing over the west coast of uh, northern Africa. The two spacecraft are now 90 nautical miles apart. Controllers for the satellite uh, did have communications uh, with it uh, during the close pass uh, between Columbia and the satellite. Columbia Houston, that's a much better view, uh, a lot more contrast visible. And how wide uh, does that tether appear to be? We, we see, it seems to resemble a, a much wider strand than we'd expect. Can you describe which way the, uh, the satellite is visible on that uh, strand? Satellite uh, now 100 nautical miles. Charlie, completely unzoomed, and uh, you see the full extent of the tether. And I tried to adjust the focus, but I can't get better than that. Okay, Claude. Thank you. Let's zoom in now. In the summer of 1999, I met with Martin Stubbs, the program manager of the cable TV station, who had recorded over 400 hours of NASA's live broadcasts. He gave me some videotape on a new incident that happened in February of 1996 on Space Shuttle Mission STS-75, um, what was called the Tether Incident. So what you just saw on the videotape showed a 12-mile long satellite, a satellite attached to a 12-mile long tether, which is like a conductor cable. It's a very, very thin, uh, one-tenth of, of a centimeter in, in, th in thickness cable that was used to conduct electricity in the Earth's ionosphere. 
As we saw earlier, space is supercharged with high energy particles and NASA was trying to take advantage of these particles to see if they could build up a charge on the tether and actually see a gain or produce some electricity. They charged the tether with some, with some electricity, but then an overload of highly charged product particles flooded the tether and produced so much electricity it snapped. On February 25th at about 7.30 p.m., the tether broke away from the shuttle Columbia and drifted about 77 miles away. So the scene you, that you just saw actually starts at about 77 miles away. The camera pans down. We see a long line, which is 12 miles long of tether, a small satellite attached to the end, and then a swarm of little objects, little balls of light, just moving in from all different directions and different velocities and different speeds. Then the cameras actually zoom in, and we actually get to take a close look at what we're seeing here. It's astounding. We see up here in the right-hand corner, we see a very large disk clearly going behind the tether. And we, look, we can actually see little, little black dots racing around to suggest some sort of a magnetic field effect. And coming through the middle, we see another very large disk moving clearly behind the tether. The light from the tether shines in front of, of the background object, which is the UFO. Um, if we use this piece of wood as an example, we can see what a disk looks like when it's passing behind a foreground object. It's really very quite simple. So if the, if the disk was passing in front of the tether, it would look something like this, and it doesn't look like that. When we look in the middle and we see this large disk passing through the middle, we can see again it's passing, it's passing behind the tether. If this was the tether and this was the UFO, we could clearly see it's going behind. And if it was going in front, it would look something like this. It doesn't look like that. So because we know the shuttle is at least 77 miles away and drifting further away from the object, from the tether, and we know the objects are going behind the tether, we can therefore use the 12 mile length of the tether as a relative measuring rod for um, actually making measurements of the minimum diameters of some of these disks. And according to my calculations, against the 12 mile length of the tether, this disk passing through the top section here measures a minimum of two to three miles in diameter. That's assuming it's right up next to the back of the tether. If it's actually farther behind the tether than I think, then the disk could be much, much larger. The further it gets behind it relative to the distance of the tether, the larger it actually is in reality in compared to measuring it against the tether. Again here, this disk going through the middle here, um, I, I estimate it to be between two and three miles in diameter. If a UFO were flying over the city of Los Angeles in the downtown core or New York, and it was two to three miles wide in diameter, it would black out the entire sky it would be an Independence Day sized craft that would, that would literally uh, cause massive panic and massive alarm. But again, when you consider that the cameras on the space shuttle here are, are seeing into the near ultraviolet spectrum of light, as we, as we learned earlier, it's a spectrum of light that's too high in energy for us to see with our eyes. But because the camera can see into it, it, it can basically be capable of capturing an image that is so high in energy that although we can't see it with our eyes, it actually still is there. We just can't actually see it. Earlier I suggested how if a UFO were capable of doing light speed travel, a solid object initially, and it could change its frequency into high frequency energy, the UFO would still, or spaceship would still have actual structure to it. It would actually still have mass, but in its high frequency state, it would turn into pure energy. Therefore, as it would appear on a camera, it would be very translucent. It would look like energy even though it has structure. And that's exactly what these objects look like. They look like almost transparent, translucent uh, disks, which actually as they pass behind some background stars, you can actually see starlight shining through them to suggest that they're in a pure wave or energy, energy form. So, and again, this one, we can see the actual magnetic field rotating very, very quickly around the craft, suggesting that what we're looking at is pure energy mass vibrating at a very high frequency. Across the top of the screen we can see a very powerful pulsing coming off of one of the UFOs as it moves across the screen. Later I would look very closely at the wave patterns on the UFO and study the wave patterns and find some incredible, incredible conclusions, incredible quantum, quantum physics and quantum energy equations. But we'll look at that much later. For now we're left with the most astounding event ever captured on film. 
the largest UFOs ever captured on film, two to three miles in diameter, and, and quite conclusive, they're definitely going behind the tether. They can't be uh, produced by some sort of an optical illusion. If this is the tether way in the background and the camera to the space shuttle is way up here, you know, you can get a really bad um, reading against using the tether, the 12 mile length of the tether, as any sort of relative measuring rod. But I'm not doing that. We are confirming, and it's very obvious, when you look at the tape that the UFOs are going behind the tether. On February 28, 1996, United Press International published an article, Satellite Signals a Puzzle, mystifying the STS-75 tether incident. When the astronauts were actually able to regain contact with the tethered satellite, they found several unexplainable surprises. The article states, there has been an event on the satellite that we do not understand yet, astronaut David Wolf told the Columbia crew. First, radio signals from the satellite caused engineers some surprise. The configuration of several systems had changed from when NASA lost contact with the craft on Sunday. For example, the spacecraft's nitrogen fuel tank was emptied and its steering thruster valves were open. In addition, a gyroscope that had been left on was powered off while two other gyroscopes remained on. All of these incidents require electronic, remote control commands from the astronauts on the shuttle. But if the astronauts did not make these commands, then who or what did? Could it have been the unidentified flying object that took over the controls of the satellite? So take a look at the tape again and see for yourself if some of the things I'm saying are not true. Dear Mr. Sarita, if the phenomena is interesting enough to deserve an investigation, then our preference would be for controlled experiments that closely duplicate the circumstances of the original observations and test our working hypotheses until they are either verified or falsified. A second line of investigation would be to obtain more evidence of the original sightings, for example, additional shuttle camera tapes. There are at least four mounted in the bay to see if the same objects were seen on these. If these objects were large, then the same object would appear on two or more cameras, and these can be used to triangulate the distance from the shuttle to the object. If there are no objects that appear simultaneously on two or more cameras, then one must conclude that the objects seen in the near fields of the individual cameras and the dust bunny hypotheses get stronger. I would ask that you apply this line of reasoning and the test proposed in my last email and above to the evidence in hand to see which more consistently explains the observations. Signed, Dr. Joseph Noon. Dear Mr. Sarita, I received your package, but other duties have kept me from watching the tape you sent. I must admit that I am somewhat reluctant to begin another dialogue with you on this subject as our last discussion nearly resulted in a formal Freedom of Information Act request on an area in which I have no formal responsibility or specialized NASA knowledge. I do not mind responding to inquiries from the public since I feel that this is part of my job as a government employee. However, I really have little interest in getting into battles when my honest attempts to answer your questions do not seem to agree with what you want me to say. My personal home VCR has been broken for a while and I have not yet had time to borrow one. When I do, I will let you know what I think that I see in the tape. Signed, Dr. Joseph Newt III. You're about to see what is called the star sequence. It's a very simple scene. The space shuttle's cameras are looking down at the Earth. Um, the space shuttle is about 300 miles above the Earth and we're looking down. We see a couple of fuzzy lights that are kind of curve shaped. And then we see a light going by, floating right by them. And then we see another one. And then we actually hear the astronauts talking and saying, I see a light going by in the ground down there. And there's a long pause. And then we hear, it could have been a star, Bill. And after that, we see a few more of these things going by. So we know between the space shuttle and the Earth, there's no stars. There, the sun is the nearest star in the solar system. So we know that this isn't actually a star going by on the ground because we're looking, we're looking right down at the Earth. There's no space between the space shuttle and the Earth where a star could possibly appear. So obviously the word star is code for something. 
but code for what? Is it code for the word UFO? You see another light going by on the ground there. It could have been a star, Bill. Hey, Roger. Okay, Bill, I'm going to switch tapes on you now and give you a, uh, a daylight view here. Okay, and one last question before you do that, Mario. Uh, could you tell in this uh, if the red Stimsonite is on the left? I believe it was based upon what I saw in the day imagery. Uh, because it was, it, 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 it remained very stable. On STS-80, if you look here, what you're about to see, this is the, this is the Earth down here. You'll, the, one of the first things you'll see on the screen is a little pulsing object. It's actually quite big. It's, ar it's around that big. Moving over here, and then you'll see it change, actually change directions and go out into space. But that's not what we're looking for. In the middle of the screen, slowly, you'll see a very big kind of translucent ball with a hole in the middle, very similar to the rest of our UFOs kind of streaking by and going into the distance. And slowly, slowly, slowly as it goes into the distance, you can see it getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So we were experiencing the depth of field of one of these large disks as it's moving past, way, way past the space shuttle and into the far distance. It basically reaches a point, and once it reaches this point of its destination, it stops moving and then it becomes extra luminous. It starts to give off some extra light. And slowly what we start to see is a formation an actual circular formation, kind of looking at an angle in, into this formation. We can see these objects that are slowly moving into position and then actually lighting up. Once they hit their positions, they're lighting up. This is suggesting incredible intelligence, something you wouldn't expect for space debris or space junk or some sort of natural phenomena. You certainly, certainly couldn't expect that meteorites or shooting stars could could fly through space and then stop at a point and then all of a sudden give off this extra luminosity. The luminosity is constant once they start giving it off. As the camera starts to slowly go away and it's moving over the curvature of the Earth, we see more and more of these things coming into position and then once they reach their positions, they light off. And then, finally, we see another object kind of like this one coming in from the foreground and heading towards the center of the circle. 
it becomes very, very faint. You can barely see it on the screen as it's moving into position. And finally, when it gets into what appears to be the center of the circle, it literally just starts shining like a diamond. And its light is luminous and continuous. This whole formation suggests amazing intelligence and amazing organization. Could this be something staged by NASA? Or could these actually be UFOs? We see two of our very familiar looking disc shaped objects coming into position here and here on your video monitor. One comes in from one direction and one comes in from another direction. And then we hear a gopher wake shield. That's something that one of the people from Huntsville, Alabama say on the radio. And then they just literally, it's after we hear go for wake show, they just literally bolt out into space and disappear in a matter of a second or two. Houston, for wake shield. So I researched what wake shield was because I thought maybe this had something to do with, a, again, a black ops test or some sort of a, of a test that NASA was doing out there. Wake shield has nothing to do with these two things. Wake shield is actually a satellite used for growing pure crystals in the wake of the satellite. When the satellite actually travels through space and it's moving, it actually produces a wake just like a boat does on a lake. And inside the wake, they grow very high quality crystals for you know computer chips and semiconductors. So wake shield has literally nothing to do with the two objects you're seeing. The objects are probably unidentified flying objects or, or UFOs. Many people would sooner die than think. In fact, they do so. Bertrand Russell. Edgar Mitchell, former astronaut who walked on the moon in 1971 during Apollo 14, has since become a major public advocate in the growing worldwide UFO movement. He speaks at UFO conventions all over the world. In a 1998 London Times News article, Mitchell was described as believing that aliens have landed on the Earth, and he has intensified his campaign to persuade Washington to acknowledge life beyond our skies. Mitchell argues that life is almost certain to exist on any other planet with a supportive environment. Some physicists, he points out, now believe it is possible to actually travel faster than the speed of light. He is 90% certain that many of the thousands of UFOs recorded since the 1940s belong to visitors from another planet. Although some have been delusions and others natural phenomena, too many remain unexplained, he said. This suggests there are humanoids manning craft which have characteristics not in the arsenal of any nation on Earth that we know of. This is very alarming, he said. Edgar Mitchell holds a PhD from MIT stands to be a perfect candidate in this particular NASA UFO investigation. Mitchell says his research, including conversations with people who have worked in intelligence agencies and military groups, have convinced him that the American government has covered up the truth about UFOs for 50 years. I thought if I sent um, Edgar Mitchell the, the tether footage, from STS-75 that he could clearly see that we were looking at the largest UFOs ever captured on film. I wrote Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell in October of 1999. On November 24, 1999, Edgar Mitchell wrote me the following letter. David Sarita, yes, I have received your film and reviewed it and the info package you provided. I see utterly nothing about the tethered incident that is particularly interesting. If there is more revealing footage, then I will look at it. However, I have looked at many feet of space film and have yet to see only one that has anything worth looking into regarding UFO appearances. Signed, Edgar Mitchell. I could not accept the idea that such a great proponent of UFOs was so adamantly against the suggestion that these giant circles passing behind the tethered satellite were UFOs. 
He was shrugging off the most astounding piece of video ever witnessed of UFOs in the history of the space program. I couldn't believe it. Dr. Mitchell, who was an MIT PhD, could not even acknowledge that the disks were clearly going behind the 12 mile length of the tether. He couldn't even see that very simple fact. I think just about any moron can tell the difference between when a disc is going behind this piece of wood and when it's going in front of it. That's in front, that is behind. This is not in front, this is behind. And that's exactly how they appear. Why couldn't Edgar Mitchell see this point? I decided to try to argue the points with Mitchell more precisely. He wrote me back almost immediately. David, at first glance they are just particles, perhaps outgassed. I do not know. But I certainly would look for a more prosaic explanation than UFOs. If you have a better film, I will look at it, but I am not very optimistic that they are anything exotic. Signed, Edgar Mitchell. Edgar Mitchell wrote to me that he thought the objects were just particles, perhaps outgassed from the, from the space shuttle. How does a particle appear to be visible from over 77 miles away? We're looking, the cameras on the space shuttle are, are at least 77 miles away and drifting past 100 miles. How do you see just little particles of dust floating by that appear as perfect giant circles with notches cut out of the side, clearly passing behind the tether, pulsing with very sophisticated uh, wave patterns? How do particles behave like this? Uh, maybe I have to relearn and reinvestigate uh, particle theory to understand some of these ideas, these ridiculous ideas that some of these scientists are coming up with. He wrote me back the following letter on December 3rd, 1999. David Sarita, I remain open-minded, but I saw nothing on the tape you sent that had sharply defined edges in the vicinity of or passing behind the tether. Also in the footage of the tether, the commentator on the spacecraft is making a running commentary. For really anything of significance in space around the tether at that time, don't you think they would have been saying something about it? If they were as big as you say, they would have been visible to the naked eye and surely reported, not ignored as seems to be the case. You comment about no infrared images. Of course not. If nothing is there, how could there be an infrared image? Signed, Edgar Mitchell. The first point that Dr. Mitchell makes here is that I saw nothing on the tape that had sharply defined edges in the vicinity of or passing behind the tether reveals that he is ignoring just how defined the edges of these huge discs are and how sharply defined they are as they travel behind the very clear edges of the tether. More precisely about the tether, we remember the Huntsville, Alabama NASA operator asking the crew and how wide uh, does that tether appear to be? We, we, it seems to resemble a, a much wider strand than we'd expect. Can you describe which way the, uh, the satellite is visible on that uh, strand? The 12 mile long tether cable was only a tenth of a centimeter in thickness and should not have been visible from over 77 miles away. There was no answer to why the, it appeared so thick because the shuttle astronauts did not know the answer then. But on Wednesday, February 28th, 1996, of the NASA STS-75 Day 7 highlights, they recorded the very reasons as the scientists report that they can measure sunlit-induced electrical charge on the tether and satellite as it moves through the daylight and night portions of its orbit around the Earth. Because the tether was charged with energy constantly by the highly charged particles in space and from the ionosphere, it produced a magnetic field around it which became sunlit and very visible. But also the report revealed that nitrogen gas from the satellite had been emptied and the gas would have become ionized, which could have produced a neon tube-like effect. This all explained precisely why the tether appeared so thick from so far away. It had nothing to do with the glare or out-of-focus theories. Claude is trying to do a, a quick, uh, good job here adjusting the cameras. Copy that. Satellite uh, now. 100 nautical miles. Charlie, completely unzoomed, and uh, you see the full extent of the tether. I tried to adjust the focus, but I can't get better than that. Okay, Claude. Thank you. I'm going to zoom in now. So precisely, the UFOs can be seen passing behind the thickness of the tethers 
sunlit induced electrical charge and ionized gas. The light shining off of the tether and the energized field obscures the light shining from the UFOs precisely because the UFOs are passing behind the tethered satellite. These are all facts that Dr. Mitchell was unaware of. This view uh, showing uh, the satellite. Dr. Mitchell was obviously not considering the NASA astronauts talking about the UFOs on alternate Department of Defense encrypted radio channels, probably because they did not have them during his own Apollo 14 mission to the moon. During long pauses between words, we might assume that the astronauts and NASA control operators are talking on Department of Defense secure channels encrypted to prevent anyone from tapping into their conversations about classified information such as unidentified flying objects. When Dr. Mitchell finished by saying, comment on no infrared image. Of course not. If nothing is there, how could there be an infrared image? Dr. Mitchell was obviously completely unaware of how objects that are vibrating with electromagnetic energy higher in frequency than the human eye can see, such as the near ultraviolet range of light, can actually exist but be undetectable in the visible and infrared ranges of light. Perhaps such observations required advanced ideas in quantum physics that he was not prepared to accept at the time. On February 18, 1999, I received the following letter from Dr. Joseph Newt III. Dear Mr. Sarita, I did look carefully at the video you sent and I really must apologize to you for not replying sooner. The objects that were on the video appear to me to be floating debris from the cargo bay of the space shuttle. These objects often appeared to be fuzzy because they got quite close to the camera and were often out of focus." End quote. The test that you just saw, I showed a video camera here on a tripod and I held a, a set of keys only four or five inches away from the camera and you could see that they were very in focus. In the background, somewhere around 100 feet away, was the tree that you saw. The point that Dr. Newth makes about the video cameras on the space shuttle, that objects as they got close to the camera appeared very fuzzy and became out of focus and, and some disappearing altogether, doesn't seem to really hold up here because video cameras don't actually work the same way optical cameras do. A regular 35 millimeter camera, as you're focused on a distant object, as objects come close to the camera they get very fuzzy, in fact they can disappear altogether. But it's not the case with uh, video cameras that have CCD imaging um, chips inside of them that actually process the images in a very different way than 35 millimeter cameras do. We have to assume, and from studies I've made into the video cameras used on the space shuttle, that they're very high tech, very high quality cameras. Many of them are off the shelf cameras, but they're, they're retrofitted with more advanced chips inside of them and also image intensifiers and special filters. So the camera that we just did the test on was a very high-tech camera, but certainly you can imagine that what they're using on the space shuttle is even better. So why, in this scene that we just did, do a pair of keys appear so crisp and so sharp and in focus at the same time we're focused on a very, very distant object? It seems to defy the explanations and reasoning Dr. Newth gave as to what we were seeing on the tape. James Olberg. Um, came up with excuses about what we were seeing. He couldn't acknowledge that the objects were going behind the tether. He just ignored the facts, the simple facts. He tried to say that what we were seeing was an optical illusion produced by the CCD in the video camera. He's trying to say that as, as these objects came near to the camera and they got close, they produced this fuzzy orb called an airy disk. When an object gets too close, to a video camera or to a lens in a 35 millimeter camera, for example, it just basically produces a very fuzzy and very soft light. It's very translucent and in some cases barely even detectable. They basically look like this. Sometimes they have a little black hole in the middle, just like our alleged UFOs do, and you get a very fuzzy kind of cloudy light around them. But all of the light is out of focus. So I can understand how he could make an assumption like that. 
but also with an airy disc phenomena, you would also never get a clear, very distinct line. When we see the UFOs going behind the tether, the line and the crispness on the line on the tether is so straight and so perfect, suggesting again that everything is in focus. When I demonstrated the test on the camera earlier, well, we passed a set of keys very close, within four or five inches of the camera, while well, the camera was focused at an object far in the distance. We noticed that the keys were very much in focus. There was no airy disk around the keys. We didn't get an effect like this. We had keys that were perfectly in focus while the tree in the background was also in focus. So what was James Obrick trying to tell me? In the year 2000, I did a lot of investigations from, with different scientists all over the world. I got contacted by an astronomer, actually the head astronomer of the, of the Canberra Observatory in Australia, Claire Williams. She had already seen the tether footage. She had already seen the STS-75 tether footage. She didn't have a very good copy of it, and we got into a furious debate about airy disks. She felt that what we were seeing on the tape in the tether were just airy disks. Airy disks are when you have like a star or a pinpoint light source and the camera lens goes way out of focus. It produces something very similar to the UFOs that we've seen on the tape. You see a very soft black hole in the middle and a very translucent disk around, around the, the pinpoint light source. So what happens is the light becomes so diffused in the lens because it's so out of focus that we get this phenomena called airy disks. And, and when many people would look at this, they would say, oh, that looks a lot like the UFOs we've seen on the tape. And I understand how Claire Williams came to these, these conclusions. But there's no way that an airy disk could appear to pass behind. And remember, in the tether incident, we had the tether, which is over you know, 77 to 100 miles away, and we saw the disk going behind it. They were not going in front of it. Once a camera lens is completely out of focus on a light source, air, all the light is out of focus. So you would have no, there's no way you would get a sharp line on the tether and then you'd get an airy disc separate from that. And if the two fused together, you would just get a lot of blurry, blurry light. When we did the test earlier with the video camera similar to the quality they're using on the space shuttle, in fact the cameras on the space shuttle are much better quality than the camera we did this test on, we held a pair of keys only four or five inches in front of the camera while well, the camera was focused on a tree uh, 100 or 200 feet away. Both were in perfect focus. That's because the depth of field of the actual camera, if this is the camera here, the video camera here, and, and the light is coming into it, what is known as depth of field is when a lens focuses on an object, say we focus on, a, on, on this CD right here, this compact disc right here, Basically, once we're in focus on this object on a regular camera, from that point on, you have something called depth of field. Meaning, if you focus on this point, as objects get further and further behind it, depending on the aperture of the lens of the camera, a smaller aperture gives you greater depth of field. Objects start to fall out of focus as they get further and further away. The same thing happens when you're focused with a regular camera on something far away, like the tether, the tether was 77 miles away and drifting into 100, and then something came close to the camera, very close, it would actually just appear as a very soft blur of lights, which is what an airy disk is. Depending on how bright the object was, it, you might get a little bit of a brighter disk. But again, these disks, and you'll see some footage of them from the spatial of what real airy disks look like, they're very distorted, very, very out of focus. You don't get details when a camera goes that far out of focus. Now the video camera is very different than a normal camera. The video camera doesn't have a film plane, it has sensors called CCDs. The CCDs in modern video cameras, such as those used on the space shuttle in the 1990s, are very similar to the cameras that we did the test on with the pair of keys and the tree in the background. With CCDs, as objects come close to the lens, while the camera is focused on a distant object, you get phenomenal depth of field, meaning the object coming close to the camera in this case, the keys were only four inches away from the camera, were perfectly in focus. At the same time, the tree was also in focus. So you could not possibly get an airy disk with a camera like this. You would have to turn all of the camera's uh, light out of focus to get an airy disk. And in this case, we know the tether was in focus, and therefore anything coming near the camera should produce a very crisp image. 
So Clara Williams' theory in regards to airy disc didn't make sense to me. Across uh, the Atlantic Ocean over uh, Africa. The image we are seeing now shows what are true airy disks. This happens because the light reflecting off of a number of very bright objects is totally out of focus. The shuttle's cameras here are way out of focus, so we notice that we cannot make any distinctions about what we are seeing with clear features. But if we watch very closely, we can see that the space shuttle's video camera is going further and further out of focus very quickly, precisely as a large, brightly glowing object, which is pulsing, traveling on a 45 degree plane from left to top right and out of frame. Could the camera operator have intentionally moved the camera out of focus to avoid capturing this unidentified flying object as it flew by at close range to the shuttle during a live NASA broadcast? We can barely identify this amazing object so similar to the disc-shaped UFO seen during the tether incident. In the test demonstrated, the only case this can happen using the shuttle's video cameras is when the camera lens is put far out of focus. When the video camera lens is in focus on a distant object, such as the tethered satellite 77 to 100 miles away, objects coming near the camera lens do not go out of focus. Therefore, they simply cannot produce airy disks. Also, more precisely, an airy disk cannot appear to pass behind an object 77 to 100 miles away, such as the tether satellite, or any distance away because they only appear when the lens is far out of focus. And when the lens is out of focus, we cannot make any distinctions about what we are seeing. Also, when you consider the number of things that look like this, in this case we have a CD, a compact disc, we all know what these are now, they look very similar, but they're not the same thing. A tire also has a hole in the middle and it has its wheel shaped. UFOs are classically disc shaped. This is what they normally look like. So because things look similar, we can't make the mistake of assuming that they're all the same thing because they look like they're the same thing. So anyway, in this debate, Clara Williams absolutely would not concede that what we were seeing were UFOs. But she did admit to me that she's mystified by this subject because she herself has actually seen UFOs. A new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. Max Planck the godfather of quantum physics. Why was this investigation on NASA UFOs moving into quantum physics? Because without some basic understanding of magnetism, gravity, and light integrated into quantum ideas, the next observations about the UFOs would be impossible to comprehend. We were about to study phenomena that only quantum physics could explain. On the night of January the 10th, 2000, a giant new theory in quantum physics exploded into my mind with crystal clarity. The theory would prove that gravity is grading in frequencies that eventually, at higher frequencies, would go far beyond light speed and that those higher frequencies of gravity would conquer the vast diameter of our own galaxy, 100,000 light years, in one second and then in zero time. Eventually, the theory would show how the highest frequencies of gravity could conquer the distance of the entire universe in zero time. Thus, gravity at this highest frequency would be the only force that is truly beyond space and time. A brand new theory in quantum physics exploded into my mind with crystal clarity. The theory would prove that eventually electromagnetism and gravity waves would go far beyond the speed of light, eventually conquering the vast distances of space in zero time. It seemed like an impossible theory. Einstein said that nothing can move faster than the speed of light. Nikola Tesla, who preceded Einstein, the inventor of the alternating current generators, radio, and over a hundred other U.S. patents, said that energy waves were vibrating many times faster than the speed of light in the higher ethers, and that eventually those waves slowed down to what we now know the electromagnetic spectrum and became visible light waves. He did experiments that actually proved his hypothesis 
but his theories were ignored as the world was heralding Einstein as a great genius. Einstein put the limit on us of light speed, and there was just no way in my mind I could accept the idea that extraterrestrial civilizations would travel as slow as light speed from 4.3 light years away from Earth, Alpha Centauri A and B, and Sirius A and B stars 8.7 light years from Earth. That was too long to take a trip to go find out who your neighbors were. There must be something called beyond light speed, and it must actually exist, and these UFOs must be utilizing energy technologies and propulsion systems that allow them to break the speed of light. Before I actually looked at the, the waves that were pulsating from the UFOs, I actually had this new theory in physics. And, it, and the, the theory doesn't, it doesn't go against traditional wave theory. It's a new way of looking at waves in a way that is not contradictory at all to the formations of our own galaxy and our own universe. Traditionally, waves, as we saw before, were looked at on their side, and as they oscillated faster and faster and faster per second, we saw an increase in energy. It was Max Planck, the godfather of quantum physics, who said, and I quoted him earlier, that energy was equal to the, to the frequency of the oscillation of a wave. The H really stands for one hertz. So one hertzian wave, one oscillation of a wave represented one hertz. Later, the H in Planck's formula became known as Planck's constant, which became identified as a quanta of photons. But actually, Max Planck didn't really believe in photons. He believed in waves. It was Einstein who came along later criticizing Max Planck and saying that really there were photons, there were mass particles. And I told, we, we discussed earlier how we went from E equals HF as the main theory in physics to E equals MC squared, mass times the speed of light squared. So today both theories are actually respected and more people are leaning towards observations in quantum mechanics, in quantum energy. Um, what I'm about to show you is, is an absolute breakthrough in wave theory. It will, it will appear very simple as I explain it, but in the outcome, you'll see how we actually break the speed of light. I call the theory gravity beyond light speed theory because looking into the core of a galaxy, looking at a galaxy, I finally understood what was going on. If a galaxy was working perfectly and created the largest amounts of energy in existence uh, known to science, then there must be something about the galaxy that could reveal to us how, how we could reach these tremendous levels of energy required to go beyond the speed of light. So looking at a galaxy, I felt I understood it for the first time. So what I did is I built what's called a galaxy clock. I'm not actually creating a galaxy. I'm creating the energy that actually created the galaxy itself. And I'm going to show you how that all works and how that relates to going beyond the speed of light. So the first thing I've done is I've used the distance that light travels per second as one inch on the galaxy clock. Light travels 186,282 miles every second. It's constant. It never changes. It doesn't slow down and then speed up. So because that's a constant, I can use that as a, as a mark on my clock. So every second on each of these wheels spiraling further and further inwards, the galaxy makes one, in one second, each wheel goes one distance of the speed of light. So this distance from here to here is equal to here. So we're going to actually see the movement of electromagnetism, which is what light is, as it moves through these concentric wheels in the galaxy clock. This line here represents gravity, force, and space, and time, which is actually the distance between the center of my clock and the outermost wheel in a, in a much greater distance. And it actually represents a force called gravity that we'll actually see growing as we move through the clock. So what I'm going to do now is, as I've already counted 12 points on the galaxy clock, I'm going to connect all of the relative lines into each concentric wheel, and you're going to start to see what's actually happening in the clock. We're going to see that second number one, this happened. We went from this line to this line. We don't really see much, much change yet. In the second second, connecting each line, we can start to see a little bit of a curvature happening in the second line. In the third second, we can see the clock is starting to curve. Space and time is actually starting to curve. The oscillations per second 
are starting to increase as we move closer to the center of the clock as we move through time. The four second. We can really see things starting to change now. The fifth second. And the sixth second. So, so far in six seconds on the galaxy clock, We've made a half an oscillation in the innermost wheel, and we've made a very insignificant amount of oscillations in the outermost wheel. So as electromagnetism starts to spiral inwards on each concentric wheel as we move inwards, we can see an increase in the oscillations of the waves. One oscillation of a wave would represent one hertz, or one, one hertz in the, in the formula of Max Planck, energy is equal to the frequency of the oscillation of a wave. So we're seeing an increase in the oscillations of waves. Therefore, we should see an increase in energy. Because as, as wave oscillates more times per second, we'll actually see energy increasing according to Planck's formula. We saw the same thing happening in the electromagnetic spectrum. The faster waves oscillated per second, the more energy they produced. We're going to learn how that energy is produced in a moment. But let's, let's go another six counts on the galaxy clock. The seven second. the eighth second, at the eight second point we're touching we're actually going almost two times the speed of light according to my theory we've touched the gravity force space and timeline here and in the same second we've crossed the speed of light twice the distance that light travels per second is this distance, but we've gone through two of them in one second. So at this point in the galaxy clock, I detect that there's so much energy present that photons and mass are starting to accelerate beyond the speed of light. So here we've gone two times the speed of light. The eighth second. The ninth second, actually. Here we've touched the wheel and we've gone just a little bit past two times the speed of light. The tenth second. All the way to here, we've almost gone two and a half times the speed of light on the tenth second. In the innermost wheel. The eleventh second. three times the speed of light in the innermost wheel and the twelfth second all the way to twelve so at this point we can start to see the formation uh, in the beginning of what looks like at the twelve count position here the spiral arm of a galaxy we can actually see the beginnings of the creation of our own galaxy our own galaxy is created by this principle. By this theory, I'm actually showing what is actually happening in our galaxy, how energy is moving, and how creation is happening. The oscillations per second here are one. One oscillation per second here, and not even, if we reached here on the outermost wheel, we, we would be at one quarter of an oscillation in the outermost wheel. So the theory is demonstrating that as electromagnetic energy, light, starts to spiral inwards on smaller and smaller orbits, we see an increase in the oscillations per second and therefore an increase in energy. And as energy increases, um, it, it starts to affect particles, it starts to affect mass. Just as uh, Dr. Earl Van Landingham said that 18 MeV protons could allow spacecraft to do one-tenth the speed of light, so as energy increases, as electromagnetic energy increases, um, as the oscillations increase, when that energy, when mass comes in contact with that energy, it starts to accelerate. But again, um, Einstein's law prohibits that solid mass can go beyond light speed. But there's another phenomenon happening in the galaxy clock. As the frequency of energy increases, so does the frequency of mass. And as mass increases in frequency, in essence it becomes lighter. 
it becomes less and less mass. So actually we're taking Einstein's theory in reverse. He's actually correct. Mass cannot attain the speed of light. But if mass becomes less mass, in other words, as its frequency is, ra is raised, mass is reducing. Mass is becoming lighter and lighter and lighter. And if mass can become lighter and lighter and lighter as it attains higher frequency, then mass can actually accelerate towards the speed of light. And in a moment, we're going to build phase two on the galaxy clock. We're going to go, we're going to start from here and go another 12 points and see what happens next. So now we're going to look at phase two of the galaxy clock. We're going to see an even further increase in the oscillation of waves as we, as we evolve in this clock. So we last left off at the 12 count position and we had already broke the speed of light. The frequency of electromagnetism or gravity, the gravity force space and timeline broke the speed of light. I never changed the speed of light on the electromagnetism moving in these, in these spirals as we moved in. On each wheel the speed of light remained a constant. We never changed the speed of light there. What started to happen was is the, the power and the frequency of gravity of electromagnetism represented by this line started to get so powerful that as we got near the center of the clock and we got to the 12 count position that force became so powerful and there was so much energy in it that it started to affect mass and mass therefore as it came in contact with these greater charges of energy started to accelerate. So now we're going to go another 12 counts up to 24 and see what happens. I've already drawn the first line the 13 line and we can see what's happening there and it takes us all the way to this point so our wave is 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 growing and it's also it's also curving more so the 14th second connecting all the lines at the 14th count on the galaxy clock we come to the 14th count right here the 15th second. All the way to the 15th position. The 16th second. Connecting each point on the galaxy clock on each wheel at the 16 count position. We're starting to see what's happening. The 17th count. Connecting each point on each wheel at the 17th count position. We come to here. The 18th count. Connecting each point on the 18th count position. And the 19th count. At this point here, we're at least six times the speed of light because in the same second, while electromagnetism is following the speed of light on the waves, the electromagnetic or gravity force, gravity force, space, and timeline in the same second is jumping from this point all the way to here. And that represents one, two, three, four, five, six times the speed of light. So it, it's incredible what's starting to happen here. We're starting to see the acceleration of mass going far beyond the speed of light. And one of the things that happens as, as photons, as any mass in this high frequency wave state starts to accelerate past the point of light, we're starting to see what's going to happen and what, what is representative of a black hole in the center of our galaxy. I'll explain that in a minute as we finish the clock. The 20th second. Connecting all the points Twenty-first second. And 
the 22nd second. And the 23rd second. We're coming down to the last Last seconds on the clock, and the 24th. What starts to happen here is the, is the oscillations here are increasing so much. Again, as we look at this, as we look at this galaxy clock, we are seeing the creation of our own galaxy. We can we can look now for a moment at what the core and what a galaxy actually looks like and we can see the same same phenomena happening the same creation is actually happening so what's actually happening is if we if we take this spiral into an eternally smaller and smaller and smaller orbit what starts to happen is the oscillations per second of the wave increase so dramatically as we get into smaller and smaller micro orbits that basically we go into the the, the millions the billions and the trillions and all the way to a Google. A number that is so high that as, as the oscillations get smaller and smaller and smaller, there's actually no end to how small we can go because we can go into the micro universe. And as we go into the micro universe, the oscillations of the wave become so high that the frequency of gravity, the, the energy in the vortex, the gravity for space and timeline is showing us that as it's curving and as it's oscillating faster and faster and faster, that mass, as it comes in contact with this force, starts to accelerate. Photons go from a lower frequency wave state into a higher frequency wave state. For example, in the radio spectrum, as we looked at the electromagnetic spectrum earlier, the lowest part of, of the EM spectrum that we know, waves are oscillating at around 1,000 times per second. By the time you get into visible uh, or even radio frequency, you're at one million times per second. A wave is oscillating one million times per second. That means uh, over a distance of 186,282 miles, if we had a wave that long and we coiled it, it would oscillate a million times in the frequency of radio. In microwaves, you're oscillating a billion times per second. And by the time you get into infrared, you're at a trillion times per second. So when we get into the visible light spectrum, we're, op we're operating and oscillating at numbers that are so high in frequency. So what's happening as this frequency increases is again the force of gravity becomes so strong that, that any mass that becomes in contact with that frequency, photons or even solid mass, the frequency of that mass becomes so high that the mass becomes in essence lighter. In other words, it doesn't have that sort of feeling of weight to it, the, the, the feeling of mass. So it starts to accelerate. So this is starting to tell us what's happening in a black hole in the center of our galaxy. If we look at a black hole, first of all, it appears black. And most scientists think that it's just a tremendous force of gravity in the center of the black hole. And they're right. But what this, what this theory shows is that there's something else happening in a black hole. We're seeing oscillations per second going so fast and that matter, mass, photons, are actually starting to come in contact with this field. And at this point, which is known as the event horizon in a black hole, matter is accelerating beyond the speed of light. And if matter accelerates beyond the speed of light, and we view the universe, we take pictures with cameras, when we look at a black hole, you can't see anything because it's oscillating faster than the wavelengths with which we see light with our brains. So we get a void. A picture of a black hole shows it to be black because it's oscillating too fast. It's going beyond the speed of light, so therefore it just appears black. If really we had cameras and wavelengths in our brain capable of seeing into higher frequencies and energies, a black hole would actually be luminous. It would just be a, a greater increase of energy, according to this theory. So as again, as we get smaller and smaller and smaller in, in, in the orbits, the oscillations per second start to go into numbers that the highest number ever counted is a Google. 
a number per second that we can't even imagine. So at that point, if we, if we could make a spacecraft that could oscillate with energy vibrations anywhere near this point, we would see that spacecraft be capable of producing energies that could allow it to conquer the speeds of light. So what does all this have to do with the UFOs? What does this have to do with the UFOs in this investigation? Well, it wasn't going to be clear to me until a month later after I had this discovery that I actually took pictures of the waves that were pulsating off of the UFOs in the STS-75 tether incident. I actually slowed the video down frame by frame and I took pictures off a TV monitor to actually look at the waves themselves. I really had no idea what I was going to find. But before we go to there, I'm going to explain a few more things about the gravity beyond light speed theory and how this, this model is, is not only showing us what's happening in our galaxy, but also is showing what's happening in our micro universe. In theory, this is just a theory. It's a theory on paper. It would have to be demonstrated and proven to be correct. One experiment done by a physicist named uh, Dr. Randall Mills at a company called Black Light Power. If we go into the micro universe, assuming that um, on my galaxy clock here, the distances I'm using, the size of this clock is about six million miles across, which is not actually that large in comparison to even our solar system. If this was Earth here and the sun is 93 million miles away, we can see if this is six million miles, it's it's not that big of an amount of space to be having these orbits um, moving through. But assuming we're, going, we're getting way into here, and this is the size of an atom, and this is the proton in the middle of the atom, and these orbits here are, are layers in which an electron orbits around the proton. The hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron. electron. And we all know that hydrogen is a source of fuel and has, is a source of energy. Dr. Randall Mills took, uh, using a chemical process, actually shortened the distance between an electron's orbit in a hydrogen atom. In other words, if an electron was orbiting here, he caused it to jump to, say, here. What would happen if we could change the orbit of an electron from here to here to the energy in a hydrogen atom? According to this theory, the answer is obvious. If the electron jumped from here to here, it would, you would see an increase in the frequency of the oscillation of the electron uh, um, around the proton. Um, here, if, if we go into an innermost wheel, if we, go, if we move into a closer wheel to the center of the proton, you would see an increase in the oscillation of the electron around the proton, and therefore an increase of energy. Well, in Randall Mill's experiments, once he shortened the distance between the, electron, um, the electron's orbit around the proton, that's exactly what happened. The hydrogen atoms started to produce more energy in the form of actual heat and in the form of actual energy waves. Although Randall Mills doesn't have the same explanation, when I applied his experiment to the galaxy clock, I saw that it fit in perfectly. So even on a micro level in the micro universe, we can see the same thing happening. An increase um, in oscillations represents an increase in energy. So now, I'm going to explain a little bit about going into this process of how electromagnetism increases as oscillations in electric fields increase. We're going to look at a little bit of a different diagram. The evidence of magnetism increasing as oscillations of photons, which are just electromagnetic waves, can be demonstrated in part by the properties of an electromagnet. If we take a conductor rod such as copper or steel and we wrap windings of copper wire around the conductor and run an electric current through the wire, the conductor rod turns into a magnet. This is because as electromagnetism through the wire oscillates around a nucleus, the conductor rod, energy in the form of magnetism, gravity, is produced in the vortex. The energy in the form of magnetism produced is relative to the frequency with which the current oscillates through the wire around the conductor. As the number of windings of wire increase around the metal conductor rod, with the same constant speed flow of energy moving through the wire, the energy in the form of magnetism gravity increases. 
This is part of what is happening in the galaxy clock. As photons of light waves oscillate into smaller and smaller orbits, the energy produced in the vortex in the form of magnetism gravity is increasing. But in the galaxy clock, electromagnetism moving at the speed of light as a constant can move into infinitely smaller and smaller orbits into the microcosm even, and the frequency of oscillations per second can also increase towards infinity. Thus, magnetism gravity is also going to increase towards infinity. Mesmerized by the amazing pulsing waves from the STS-75 Tether Incident UFOs, I decided to take a look at the waves frame by frame. I felt they might reveal the propulsion system of these giant UFOs. I once asked Dr. Glenn Seaborg, who shared the Nobel Prize with Macmillan for the discovery of plutonium, former chair of the Atomic Energy Commission under Presidents Kennedy, Johnson and Nixon, authorizing all of the nuclear weapons testing at the Nevada test site, about anti-gravity generators being developed by alternative energy developers. He answered me and said, if anyone could build a gravity generator, they would have an energy source far beyond nuclear fusion and I don't believe anyone is doing anything like that yet. On a huge TV screen with a flawless S video VCR and with the help of Steve Orkland, an amazing zero-point energy scientist, we identified and freeze-framed the first pulse of the UFO as it was passing over the top of the 12-mile long tether. We were both astounded and in such awe I could barely speak. It was a profound moment in this investigation. We were looking at what appeared to be a gravity wave with a steep spiral radiating from the UFO right out of the Phase II galaxy clock. It was the clear signature of a powerful gravity wave that was clearly bending light into the shape of the incredible magnitude of the wave. The wave radiated right out of the black hole in the center of the UFO and we could see clearly that by the extreme steepness of the wave coming out of the black hole, that the hole was the point where gravity produced in the UFO's propulsion system was faster than light. And because our eyes and cameras could not produce a signal that fast, it appeared black as the mystery that beckoned me with the knowing that the UFOs were capable of utilizing such high frequency gravity waves that they could conquer the speed of light and visit us from another star system. The phase two pulse was equally astounding because it showed an outward pulsing ring, another phenomenon that happened in the galaxy clock when each inner ring completed an oscillation. It produced an outward moving wave and as all the rings in the galaxy clock completed their oscillations, the wave would radiate out to the periphery of the clock. But this was also telling me that the extremely high frequency magnetism gravity produced in the center of the UFO's gravity generator was being distributed throughout its mass. There had to be a reason for this, I thought, but was this the UFO's propulsion system? The phase three pulse was showing the ring moving back towards the center as if to see the galaxy clock moving in the opposite direction. Perhaps they alternated their pulses in time forward with time reverse and there was some reason for doing this. Perhaps this prevented the high frequency pulsing energy from dissipating and keeping the mass of the UFO in a high frequency wave state. I really believe that the answer to our future space program was staring at us with a clear signature from a most profoundly advanced extraterrestrial civilization. But who were they? The answer would take more time. I sent the photographs of the three-phase poles to Dr. Newth and wrote him the following letter on January 22, 2000. Dear Dr. Newth, I just wanted to see if you received the photos from the NASA video I sent you. Also, have you seen the videotape yet? What do you think of the pulsing waves of light in their particular formations? Dr. Newth wrote me back the following letter on February 22, 2000. Dear Mr. Sarita, Yes, I received your photographs and they are indeed quite peculiar. 
However, at least in the photographs, I have seen nothing that could not be explained as floating debris illuminated through sharp shadows in the shuttle bay. Maybe the videotape shows different things. I will try to see the tape soon. Signed, Joe Newth. In the year 2000, I read on the cover of an old issue of Discover magazine from August of 1998, was Einstein wrong? News broke that a professor at the University of California at Berkeley, Dr. Raymond Chow, had caused photons to do 1.7 times the speed of light. Dr. Chow did an amazing experiment using atomic clocks to measure the speed at which photons traveled through normal space at the speed of light, and next to this, he ran photons through a quartz glass barrier and they actually tunneled, he said, through the barrier at an astounding 1.7 times the speed of light. When I read the words tunneling photons, I applied them to my galaxy clock and the answer as to why the photons passed through the quartz glass faster than photons that didn't was so obvious. The tunneling photons, which were just electromagnetic waves by my new theory, tunneled in such microscopic orbits that the magnetism gravity produced in the vortex produced more energy than required for photons to do light speed. When the magnetism gravity signal got too powerful, the photons increased in energy frequency, thus they became even more energized and lighter than they already are, and they broke the speed of light. The implications towards understanding this are astounding. Because the energy required for photons to move at the speed of light is a fixed number, and we can now see in the galaxy clock that gravity is increasing towards infinity, the magnetism gravity will eventually conquer the point where the energy of gravity will be greater than that needed for photons to move at the speed of light. At this point, where oscillations of waves per second are so high, the energy gravity produced in the vortex will cause photons to move faster than the speed of light. Increase in oscillations of photons, light waves, causes an increase in magnetism gravity. At the center of a galaxy is a black hole where the oscillations of electromagnetism per second grow towards the infinity of a black hole's smaller and smaller orbiting photons and the electromagnetic waves. The smaller and smaller orbiting photons are producing greater and greater increases in gravity at the center of the black hole. When any mass comes in contact with higher and higher frequency magnetism gravity, the mass becomes lighter and lighter until it easily glides towards the speed of light and far beyond. By this new theory, a black hole's event horizon is the point where photons and mass become so light and with such highly quantized electromagnetic energy, they glide faster than the speed of light. The event horizon merely appears black just because as photons and mass are accelerating beyond light speed and we cannot see anything moving that fast, the signal appears void because we can only see events in what I now call relative light speed time. Canadian scientist John Hutchison is the discoverer of what is now known as the Hutchison effect. I met with him in the year 2001 to learn about his work and to show him the galaxy clock and gravity beyond light speed theory. His work demonstrated the principle perfectly. He was the first scientist to change the frequency of mass from a low 7 to 8 hertz wave state to a higher frequency. He did this in an amazing experiment where he bombarded a 75 pound cannonball with high frequency waves produced by Tesla coils radio waves, and Van de Graaff waves. As the 75-pound ball absorbed the high-frequency magnetic waves, its mass became lighter and so light that it actually started to levitate. If we can change the frequency of mass into a high-frequency wave state, it can eventually turn into a form so light that the energy required for propulsion for a spacecraft would reduce or become more efficient and allow us to experience less and less inertia, therefore experience less g-force in spaceflight. If mass could become so light that it became as light as a photon, mass or spacecraft could attain the speed of light with very little energy in the form of actual propulsion. 
if mass or spacecraft could transform into such a high frequency wave state that it went far beyond the frequency of waves in the visible light spectrum, mass or spacecraft could become invisible. Higher yet, mass or spacecraft could break the speed of light. Now it was very clear to me how the UFOs were traveling beyond light speed. They were pulsing their spacecraft with such high frequency waves of energy that the spacecraft reduced its mass to the point that it became so light, lighter than a photon, and when mass becomes that light, it takes so little energy for it to move at the speed of light and beyond. The answer to how we could propel ourselves to the stars was being transmitted to us in the form of a gravity beyond light speed energy wave, the very signature to how a spacecraft could break the speed of light and visit us from outside our own solar system and possibly from one of our nearest stars. In 1996, just after the STS-75 tether incident, NASA opened the Breakthrough Propulsion Physics Lab, a new project at NASA designed to look at advanced concepts in space energy and propulsion, even beyond light speed theories. Was it a coincidence? In 1998, Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz, an American physicist, who heads the NASA Advanced Space Propulsion Lab near Houston, Texas, an astronaut on board the space shuttle STS-75 Tether Incident Mission suddenly developed a new type of propulsion rocket drive system for NASA. Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz had invented a revolutionary type of rocket engine that utilizes high energy pulsed electromagnetic waves called the Variable Specific Impulse Magnetoplasma Rocket. The key words were pulsed and electromagnetic waves. Did Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz see something on STS-75, the same UFOs we are seeing on the video today? Was he trying to reverse engineer the kind of physics that he thought he was seeing radiating from the UFOs? You're about to see what we call the interdimensional shift sequence. It's an amazing sequence because it shows something actually moving from one dimension into another. A, a UFO that appears to just suddenly come from nowhere as if from another dimension. But now we have a little bit of an idea of what that actually means. You're going to see the curvature of the earth down here and you're going to see a lot of lightning flashes on the ground here. And then you're, you're going to see a brightly glowing object kind of moving very slowly into frame here and then it kind of just stops around here and there'll be a lot of uh, what appear to be again what NASA will try to tell us are shooting stars or meteorites streaking by some of them actually leaving the earth you're going to see things coming straight in and disappearing into the clouds it's really a powerful scene but watch up here at about this point in the screen keep your eyes focused there because all of a sudden out of the black void of space above the earth a disk with the familiar, the familiar shape just suddenly, out of nowhere, just appears. How did this happen? The space shuttle's actual cameras, the black and white cameras that we're looking at, can see into the near ultraviolet, uh, a frequency of light that humans can't see because it's too high in energy. We know that if the UFO is actually mass vibrating at a high frequency wave state, all of the UFO has to do is go into a higher level of energy, and it can simply suddenly disappear. But in reverse, if the UFO were actually already in a higher frequency than the cameras could detect, somewhere up in the far ultraviolet or the X-ray or gamma ray spectrum, all it has to do is slow its energy down to that equal to the, the energy levels of the, the near ultraviolet or the visible light and suddenly the UFO would appear. I remember in 1968 when I saw the first and only daylight UFO I'd ever seen for over half an hour I watched with hundreds of people in amazement in Berkeley, California in 1968 looking up into the sky and we watched this disk, this incredibly visible metallic disk just hover there and all of a sudden blinking out and disappearing in a matter of a second. It didn't accelerate and go somewhere else, it actually just disappeared. So essentially the UFO I saw in 1968 did the same thing but in reverse of what you're seeing here. This UFO 
is doing the opposite. It's slowing down an energy and suddenly just appears in our dimension and all of a sudden it just kind of drifts by and you'll see a lot of other exciting things in this part of the video. As the space shuttle is moving in a prograde orbit around the Earth at 18,000 miles per hour, seen moving from right to left, we can now see a large disc-shaped unidentified flying object accelerating from the lower right beyond the speed of the space shuttle. Now the object slows down and appears to be hovering, an illusion caused as it flies at the same speed as the shuttle, as if following it, an impossible feat for a natural object. We see lightning flashes down on the ground and objects moving in all sorts of different directions down below. And now an object streaks by at amazing speed, far faster than the speed of any meteorite or shooting star or known manned spacecraft. Now in the center of the screen, we can see an unidentified flying object suddenly appearing, giving off a tremendous luminosity as it appears to be moving from the higher dimension of energies into a dimension where the visible wavelengths of the camera could observe its light. As we now understand the electromagnetic spectrum and that the human eyes can only see the visible light spectrum, when an unidentified flying object moves from an energy dimension into our visibility, it is clearly changing frequency of its entire mass from a purely quantized energy state and lowering it to a level of energy where we can actually observe it. This demonstrates that the UFOs are capable of altering the frequency of their mass and their craft from solid mass into pure energy and light and thus can attain the speed of light. It is dangerous to be right when the government is wrong. Voltaire. The ancient megalithic ruin Stonehenge, believed to be constructed by the ancient Druids in approximately 2900 BC, embraces the midsummer sunrise and beckons the stars above on Salisbury Plain near Wiltshire in southern England. Many astronomers believed it was an ancient clock to the sun, moon, and the stars with precise alignment patterns that continue to mystify scientists today. Was our ancient past about to reveal a mystery so great that it would wait until we realized that our very own future was inside of our past? Across from Stonehenge in a farmer's field in 1996, the same year as the NASA STS-75 tether incident, a crop circle appeared with the identical message of the gravity wave pulsating from the UFO. It was a crop circle with the nearly exact same degree of a spiraling wave curvature even with the hole in the center, just as the NASA STS-75 pulsing UFO revealed. Were intelligent beings trying to send us a message so clear and with such regularity that it was intended for us to decode? 
was the message the secret to their propulsion systems and a gravity generator energy source capable of solving our environmental energy pollution crisis? In 1938, a Chinese and Tibetan team of archaeologists led by Chinese professor Chai Pu Tei from the University of Beijing discovered an astounding burial site high in the mountains of Bayan Kara Ula on the border of Tibet and China. The Chinese-Tibetan team found a gravesite containing the skeletal remains of what appeared to be tiny people with large bulbous heads. The team found that the cave area is still inhabited by two tribes that have some of the same physical attributes. They are frail in their bodies and stand between 3 foot 6 and 4 foot 7 with an average height of 4 foot 2. The two tribes are known today as the Hans and the Zopas. But then the research team found evidence of an extraterrestrial origin. They found a series of large stone round discs in the burial caves. The discs were round, had a square notch cut out of the side with a hole in the middle and a spiraling groove of ancient written characters spiraling out from the center that would be later translated by a Chinese scientist named Dr. Sum Um Nui in 1962. In 1965, 716 more grooved dropa stone discs were discovered in the same burial caves. The researchers were told by the local tribespeople that the stone discs marked an event that happened some 12,000 years ago. When we compare this amazing NASA UFO photo to the Dropa stone disc, we can see an astounding perfect match. We can see a disc-shaped UFO, a black hole in the center, the square notch cut out of the side, and a spiraling wave radiating out from the center of the disc to the rim, all identical to the 12,000-year-old Dropa stones. Could this be the very signature that an ancient civilization wanted us to see? Could these ancient peoples of China and Tibet have recorded an event 12,000 years ago describing UFOs right down to a magnetic, pulsing wave of energy? In the early 1960s, Professor Tsum Um Nui broke the code of the characters written in the tiny writing of the spiraling groove of the Dropa Stone. Eventually, the translation of the disc was published. The translation revealed that some 12,000 years ago, a spacecraft from another planet had crash-landed in the local mountains. A deep rumbling shook the ground, frightening the animals and the local people. They saw a glowing ball of light shaped like a disc streaking across the sky, which crash-landed into the forest. The hunters were afraid. When the hunters found the disc-shaped craft, they described it as shiny, with an opening in the side of it, hence the square notches, and they saw something moving inside. The story further reveals that the Dropa Stones were ancient artistic stone carvings depicting the crash-landed spacecraft. The similarity to the modern NASA UFOs was astounding. Could this be a signature to tell us just whom our modern-day visitors are? Carved on the wall of the caves was a drawing that showed a pictograph of the rising sun, the moon, unidentifiable stars, and the earth all joined together by lines of pea-sized dots, possibly indicating the origin of the star people who had crash-landed on the earth 12,000 years ago. But what if the dots could tell us what star system the aliens came from? In 1947, after viewing a Dropa stone disk, English scientist Dr. Carl Robin Evans learned that the Zopa tribe's language he later learned from Lurgan La, the religious guardian of the Zopa people, the history of the Zopa people's origins. He was told that they originally came to Earth from a planet in the star system of Sirius about 20,000 years ago. Now if we could assume that the NASA UFOs, by their amazing identical signature to the Dropa stones, the disc shape, the black hole in the center, and the spiraling groove, the square notch cut out of the side, were from the very same place the star system of Sirius, we might know just whom our modern day visitors are. Could beings from Sirius be visiting Earth today? The Zopa religious leader told Dr. Carl Robin Evans that there was a curiosity to their Syrian ancestors' visits to Earth. From different sources we have 10,000 BC from Dr. Sum Um Nui to 18,000 BC to the year 1014 AD. 
Considering the curiosity to the Syrian visits to Earth, could NASA astronauts and Earth have been visited by the same beings back in 1996? The similarities are too astounding to ignore, and they will get even deeper as the star Sirius shines 8.7 light years away from Earth. I would then be led to read Robert Temple, a British astronomer's book, The Serious Mystery. An obscure tribal people of Mali, northwest Africa called the Dogons, isolated from the outside world for countless centuries, are guardians to sacred knowledge about the star system of Sirius, knowledge that has migrated with their highest priests from pre-dynastic Egypt earlier than 3000 BC. They spoke of highly advanced astronomical knowledge of the Sirius star system. The Dogon priests actually had maps of the star system of Sirius. Long ago, they actually said Sirius had an A star and it had a B and a C star. And both the B and the C star would revolve in an elliptical orbit around the main star every 50 years. So you would have a 50-year orbit of the B and the C star. At this point in time, we had only seen the B star. And when Robert Temple wrote his book in 1972, he didn't know anything about the evidence of actually finding the C star. So at this point, it seemed like a myth. No one really knew if these Dogon priests were accurate with modern astronomy. But in 1995, two French astronomers actually detected the existence of Sirius C. And when they did their measurements on it, they actually found that both B and C did indeed have an elliptical orbit around the star system of Sirius every 50 years, to precisely as the Dogon priests had, had told. Also, in 1997, the same two uh, French astronomers detected planets orbiting around the stars in Sirius B and C. So this would indicate the possibility of life, that beings could actually come from there. So if the Dogons were accurate about all this other information, and it wasn't just some sort of ancient myth, then perhaps they were even accurate about what they also knew about the very beings who came from the star system Sirius. The African Dogon tribe's priests prophesied the return of the Syrian gods and goddesses to Earth, whom they call the Nomos. They say the return of the Nomos will be called the Day of the Fish, as the Syrians were known as aquatic beings, half fish and half human. If we see this African Dogon priest drawing of what ancestral knowledge says the ancient Nomos looked like, we can see the image of a spacecraft attached to a large fishtail, an image that beckons us with a profound symbology used by ancient peoples to describe the amphibious quality of these ancient beings from planets in the Sirius star system. Now if we assume that these Syrian Nomo gods and goddesses were amphibious and had to travel all the way from Sirius 8.7 light years away from Earth, they would need water to encapsulate their bodies in while they were in deep space transit. Now the mystery is unfolding. Robert Temple wrote in his book, The Serious Mystery, published in 1976, we should not forget that if aquatic amphibious beings are making an interstellar voyage, they will need fresh water in their ship in considerable quantities. As this investigation began with NASA scientist Dr. Louis A. Frank's detection of water balls, the connection to Sirius was pointing towards water once again. Dr. Frank really believes these are balls of water, water balls, the size of small houses entering our Earth at a rate of 10 to 20 million impacts a year. But remember the problem that Dr. Newth came up with. Because the water balls, there were so many of them entering our Earth's atmosphere, so many, he detected that no satellite has a chance of surviving days, let alone years, if these were actually meteors. In fact, the space shuttle he felt him that could be, should actually be struck by one of these objects. Yet he said no satellite has ever been struck by one of these objects, a fact that actually disturbed Joseph News so much that he doesn't actually believe these things are water. And remember, I detected the only possible answer for the, that to occur would be if the water balls were going around the satellites, actually going around them, and that would detect intelligence. The ancient Dogon priests, actually describe the Syrians traveling in watery-like spacecraft from the star system Sirius to kind of encapsulate these half-fish, half-human gods 
in their transit from this star system 8.7 light years away. Watery spacecraft, watery balls. And when we take that all the way back to Dr. Frank's discovery at NASA of water balls, these incredible water balls, so many of them, it seemed to come together. There was an amazing coincidence that I couldn't ignore. There was a distinct possibility that these water balls were actually Syrians in transit to Earth. Or even another possibility, because they were gods of water, they would be masters of water. And perhaps some of these water balls were actually their craft, but others may have actually literally been balls of water being dropped on our Earth to help heal our ozone layer. Because as I explained earlier, water eventually breaks down into hydrogen and oxygen under intense solar radiation, and therefore the oxygen would eventually transmutate into O3, which is ozone. So could ancient Syrian gods be actually helping us heal, heal our ozone layer? Temple further wrote that the Dogon spoke of an interstellar ship being encased in a thin metal shell probably manufactured in the solar system, which is essentially hollow, perhaps even largely empty, like a balloon or containing water at the center, suitably insulated and heated. Temple was inadvertently describing Dr. Louis A. Frank's discovery of the mysterious water balls, which were so high in energy they evaded detection on infrared satellites, probably because they were encased with a radiant barrier, Temple's thin metal shell, to protect them from the intense radiation from the sun and other cosmic rays. But Dr. Frank made his first discovery in 1985, unpublished at the time, and Temple wrote and published his book, the Serious Mystery in 1976, nine years earlier. In fact, he never even wrote about or learned of Dr. Frank's water comet mystery. We should not forget the Dogon priests say the gnomals will return, and when they do, it will be called the Day of the Fish. The first indication of their return, say the Dogon, will be that a new star will appear in the sky, the star of the tenth moon. Could the new stars of the 10th moon be the same as the enormous 2-3 to three mile wide UFO seen on the NASA STS-75 mission in 1996? The Dogon priests also say that the elements which are at the moment retracted inside the body will re-emerge. Then the nomos will re-emerge. Then the nomos will land on the earth again in their ark, the landing craft. From this ark will emerge the mythical ancestors namely the very same personalities who figure in all the myths. So, there will presumably be political implications to their arrival. After their return, this group of nomos will rule from the waters as they are masters of water. Seven thousand years ago, in Babylonian mythology, there was a god named A, later called Oines by the Greeks who suddenly emerged from the ocean. A was a water god. He was depicted with the upper body of a man and the lower body of a fish. According to ancient peoples, he taught architecture, math, astronomy, and early sciences to help humankind come out of the dark ages and enter civilization. Oin's fish-tailed feminine counterpart, the moon goddess Atargates, was the earliest mermaid deity. She was the predecessor of the Greek love goddess, Aphrodite, and water was their primordial element. Columbia and the satellite are now just passing over the west coast of uh, northern Africa. The home of the Dogon tribe who prophesied the return of the Syrian gods and goddesses, the Nomos, was in Mali, northwest Africa. Was it a coincidence that the shuttle was passing directly over northwest Africa, their precise location, during the astounding incident when the tethered satellite was swarmed by UFOs with the signature of the star system of Sirius written all over them? But as the Dogon priests were keepers of this ancient knowledge from pre-dynastic Egypt around 3000 BC, and the shuttle would be passing directly over Egypt within a few moments, it appeared as yet another coincidence beyond reason. We had to look at what the Egyptians knew about the star system of Sirius. Because the Dogon tribe migrated to northwest Africa originally from Egypt in 3000 BC, 
who would have to look at what the ancient Egyptians knew about the star system of Sirius and the great gods and goddesses who came to Earth thousands of years ago and brought humankind from primitive life to modern civilization. Because today we may have an indication that they have returned, perhaps to bring us to yet a higher level of civilization. In Robert Temple's book, The Sirius Mystery, we learn of the Syrian water god connection to ancient Egypt from the ancient Greek father of history, Herodotus, who studied in Egypt during his life in the 5th century BC. Herodotus details an amazing connection to Sirius and water when he recounts how the ancient Egyptians channeled large amounts of water through canals from the Nile River called Sirius in ancient times to the many sacred temples, sites, and the pyramids themselves. The ancient kings had their own burial chambers filled with water to emulate their gods and goddesses likeness to water. Even Kefren's pyramid had a passage bringing water in from the Nile which encircled it like an island in which the ancient said the great Cheops lies symbolizing the ancient god of Egypt as an amphibian. Herodotus described how the incredible maze of canals and passages bringing water to so many of the sacred temples and shrines even the pyramids themselves was a sight that he felt surpassed even the pyramids themselves. The great Egyptian goddess Isis, the wife of the chief of the Egyptian god Osiris, symbolized as the all-seeing eye, was herself also symbolized as an all-seeing eye with a throne. Osiris was said by one of Aristotle's companions who visited Egypt, heard of an ancient myth that Osiris could not walk because his legs were grown together. Does this tell us once again that he too was an amphibian from the star system of Sirius? Known to the ancient Egyptians as the star system Sirius herself, Isis tells that I am she who goes out to the dog star. Because she is the wife of Osiris, they must both be the same kind of beings and they must both be from the same star system of Sirius. Isis spoke of her travels to the star system of Sirius, so how did she travel there? Was she actually just visiting Earth from Sirius? Did she travel to Earth from Sirius in a spacecraft? Being a goddess of water, would she travel between Earth and Sirius in a watery spacecraft, just as the Dogons told? Both the Dogon and Isis called Sirius the dog star and symbolized it as a dog, but why? Perhaps it was because the great Egyptian god Anubis symbolizes a half-man, half-dog, God was said to be the god of the star system Sirius by the ancient Egyptians. Anubis was also known as the god of the dead, who would guide the pharaohs and the spiritually adept of ancient Egypt upon their death in a celestial boat to their heavens in the star system of Sirius. The mystery as to what caused the water erosion around the Sphinx has baffled archaeologists since its discovery. The water erosion markings were much too high on the Sphinx to suggest that the Nile River had ever flooded that high. But Herodotus accounts of channeling water to fill small lakes that encompass the shrines of their Syrian gods and goddesses. Could the ancient Egyptians have built these giant water receptacles to make a place to stay for their half-human, half-amphibian gods and goddesses as they would visit them from the star system of Sirius? The mystery of the Sphinx revealed itself to Robert Temple as a half-dog, half-human, instead of the half-human, half-lion pervading theory. Temple argues that the body of the Sphinx is too long in its torso to be a body of a lion, as lions have rather short torsos, whereas dogs have very long ones. So Temple felt that the body of the Sphinx was a dog, as an emulation of the Syrian god Anubis, symbolizing what the Dogon tribe called the dog star Sirius. But once again, Temple extracts from the Greek historian Herodotus that the body of the Sphinx was originally lying in a man-made lake surrounded by water, explaining the mystery as to why the Sphinx was so eroded by water at such a high level. This also demonstrated that Anubis was a god of the waters. As the great gods of Sirius living in Egypt were masters of water and presumably knew how to manipulate the waters, could they send and direct balls of water from deep space and bring rain in large quantities 
and transform the arid deserts into a thriving oasis with rich agriculture? It was written that Egypt in ancient times had a rich and thriving agriculture. Could these ancient masters of water have turned a desert into an oasis because they had such power over the waters? We are reminded of the many great miracles of mastery over water. When Moses had God part the Red Sea, when God caused the great flood in the time of Noah and warned him of the flood well in advance of its arrival. Could this be because Noah's God had mastery over water and he knew the flood was coming because God just had to send huge amounts of water in from deep space and have it rain down on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights? We are also reminded of the many miracles of Jesus Christ where he walked on the water and turned the sea into wine and he commanded the sea to a calm when his disciples feared that the severest ocean storm would claim their lives, once again showing mastery over water. Robert Temple also wrote in his book, The Serious Mystery, that the Dogons actually believed that Jesus too was a nomo from the star system of Sirius and therefore a god who had mastery over the waters. The great masters of water could also direct and send giant balls of water down onto our Earth's atmosphere, guiding them around satellites and the shuttle to prevent collisions, and the water would eventually transform under solar radiation into hydrogen and oxygen, and the oxygen would transmutate into ozone, yet another benevolent act by the ancient goddesses and gods to help heal our failing ozone layer. Former science advisor to Walter Cronkite, Richard Hoagland, a profound space researcher, discovered that on May 27, 1999, NASA launched space shuttle mission number STS-96 at 6.50 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, three years after the STS-75 tether incident, with the star system of Sirius at 33.33 degrees from the horizon at the launch site in Cape Canaveral, Florida. But why was Sirius at precisely 33.33 degrees during this launch, the highest symbol of enlightenment in Masonic wisdom? Because all of the founding fathers of the Constitution of the United States of America were highest degree Masons, and that the Washington monuments were all designed in the order of perfect architecture and masonry, this was no coincidence. Even the United States $1 bill seen with the pyramid with an eye hovering above it was a symbol used by the ancient Egyptians for their chief god Osiris, the husband to Isis, the gods of the Sirius star system. Were the highest powers at NASA using symbology to tell the star system of Sirius that they had understood just who our visitors are and that we have received their message and we were sending a reply that said, yes, we understand who you are and that you have returned. 